We're live now, Mayor McQueen. Thank you for your patience. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for the patience of uh, those from the viewing public and our council and staff. Welcome to our first hybrid council meeting. It's sort of uh, great steps to coming back to where we all want to be in the sense of uh, being done with COVID and all this. Uh, well, I would say that the, the process that we've had to go through the, for the past uh, 16 months. We do have a, again, welcome council, staff, and the viewing public. Uh, welcome to our council meeting on September 1st. And just as before we move forward, I just want to point it out to everyone from the viewing public that we do have uh, plexiglass between us who are sitting here in the chamber for our protection. And uh, so those that you may not see that, it's very transparent. You can see it's brand new, so you can't uh, see the, the glass here between myself and the Madam Clerk, but it's there for our protection. And if we do leave our stations where uh, to put a mask on if we do anywhere we'll, within the building and uh, around other people. So we are still following the strict protocols that we have in place, but uh, again, is a happy, happy place. We're moving forward with maybe getting to that new place of back to normal. So again, welcome. Uh, Madam Clerk, did I miss anything on, on those announcements? Or? Uh, no, the only thing I would add is that at the present time, we are not admitting the public into council chambers just because of those uh, health and safety protocols that we're following. But we hope to move forward with that when public health and restrictions lift a little bit further. Great, thank you, Madam Clerk. I do wanna say at this time also from our staffing and everything that we've been able to go to, to conduct the business of the municipality, I wanna thank staff and council and uh, be able to move forward with the business through the processes that we've been following and it's been working very well and uh, again thank you for for all that hard work that uh, all it's been able to do to get us to where we are because the business does need to continue that's for sure so we do have um, a published uh, agenda that was on our website and it's in front of us today and uh, i guess i'm going to go out to uh for those that are on council and i know we do have um, Councillor Veliquette, Councillor Little, Councillor Allen, and Councillor Allwood, who are, are um, sharing us today through Zoom. Uh, certainly myself, my Deputy Mayor Cash Desai, and Councillor Nielsen are here, along with our Madam Clerk and our Deputy Clerk here in the office or in the Council Chambers itself. So, yes, sorry, CAO uh, Govan is, uh, she's, fo she's following up through Zoom. I don't see her. Well, I was going to do that later on, but I can do that right now. I have to have it at my desk, but um, I was going to follow that up after pecuniary, uh, pecuniary interest. So um, so we do have a, an agenda in front of us. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda that is being presented today? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, there was an email that had come out earlier, and I don't mean to put Councillor Valiquette on the spot, but there was an email that a notice of motion had been missed. And I just wanted to confirm if um, Councillor Valakat still intends on in having that on the agenda today. Okay, thank you for that Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Valakat. Uh, thank you to uh, our uh, Deputy Mayor uh, through uh, you, the Chair. Um, actually in discussion with the clerk, we've decided just to ask permission to put it on as a notice of motion. Um, and so we will deal with it in section 10, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you for uh, that, Deputy Mayor. And just for um, our councillors that are on Zoom, am I coming across loud enough or can you hear us uh, well enough? Everyone else? Okay, that's great. I always need to do that sound check. Are there any other additions or deletions for the agenda? Um, I know, Councillor Allen, I know there was a seniors uh, meeting this week. I don't know, was that supposed to be added to, asked to be added to this agenda? Uh, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I know that you were at that meeting. It, um, it wasn't to be added to the agenda, but I will speak on that um, when we discuss your notice of motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. So seeing there's no other additions to the agenda, can I have a, a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Nielsen and Councillor Allwood. I think it used to looking left and right here as well. So any discussion on that uh, motion? Uh, seeing that, all in favor? 
That is carried. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll do open form and there is a staff announcement that I will be bringing up after de declaration of pecuniary interest. So at this time, uh, through you, I guess, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, you're following up with the open forms. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Actually, we have coordinator Vanel Stein in attendance today. So she'll be taking on that part for our open forum and the delegations. Okay, thank you. So there she is. Good afternoon. There's, good afternoon. There's one member registered um, for open forum, Heather Davidson, speaking on item 6.2. And I will allow her to speak now. Okay. Soon. Oh, I see that she's on the screen. So good afternoon, Heather. Heather, are you able to unmute yourself? I'm unmuted now. Is that all right? We can hear you. Okay. So, Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. So, Mayor McQueen and councillors, thank you for giving me time today to present a request for action on the part of the municipality. I'm a spokesperson for the Gray County Action Group uh, for, on climate change. And I don't know about you, but I've begun to feel completely swamped with the sheer volume of information, stories, and my own observations of climate change. So such as the decreasing bird population, we have no swallows after having filled an apartment building for them for years. Uh, there's no frogs in the long grass. There are few minnows for my grandchildren to net and then release. And have you noticed there's few insects on the windshield at night? So, Whenever um, I ask myself what I can do as an individual, I begin to feel even more helpless. The task ahead seems insurmountable. What can I do that is possible and gives voice to a larger number of voices? One simple answer is to change the I to we. One action group, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, they call themselves OCAA, has prepared a petition to present to Mr. Ford, Premier of Ontario. The gist of it being to change his mind about his plan to fire up the former gas-fired electricity generators when our aging nuclear plants reach the end of their lives. He is going to use natural gas as fuel, fossil fuel. The, world, the word natural makes the whole phrase sound healthy, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it isn't we will end up losing a generation of progress on the crucial challenge of reducing greenhouse gases. The OCAA recently gave a well-prepared presentation to the Gray County Climate Action Group containing a formal petition to Mr. Ford to change his plans to help us reach our ambitious targets for 2030. As well as a petition to eliminate the petition offers the most logical replacement, tap into Quebec's huge surplus of hydroelectricity. Hydro-Quebec generates enough hydropower to service nearly 100% of the provincial needs and is referred to as the green battery of Northeastern Ontario. As of today, in addition to many individual petitioners who have signed this petition, 30 municipalities or city councils have signed and sent the petition. Included in the list as of the end of June are Toronto, Guelph, Brampton, Peel Region, Grimsby, Bracebridge. Just recently, the Grey Bruce CAG, Township oh, so Heather, you've just gone past your three minutes. Can you wrap it up in 10 seconds, oh, if that's yep. possible? By acting on the request to send, uh, I'd like you people to send the, the petition signed into Mr. Ford. Thank you. Sorry about that, Heather, but we do have the three minute yep. rule. Oh, not, I understand perfectly. But I think we got uh, your, the gist of what you were saying. So thank you very much for your open forum comments. Thank you. Okay. Going back then, do we have anybody else, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, for open forum? 
There's oh, no sorry. nobody else registered for open forum. Okay, thank you. I, I messed up already there. Sorry about that. All right. Habit of it's hard to move the habit of of habit. Okay, so we've passed the open forum. At this point, since we do have a published uh, agenda, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest with regards to council members? All right, there's none to declare at this time. If one does arise, you can declare at that time and have the proper paperwork to uh, fill out later. At this time, I'm going to go to our CAO with a bit of a staff announcement. I shouldn't say a bit of a staff announcement. I'm just gonna say about a staff announcement. <laughs> Madam CAO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Council, for your indulgence. Um, I have a special announcement about a very special person who has contributed so much to Grey Highlands. Uh, Wilda Allen has announced her retirement uh, as of December 31st of this year. Um, most of you uh, in the public know Wilda. She's been around for over 40 years and has been instrumental in creating such a great library system for Grey Highlands. Um, I believe um, uh, Council Allen and, and his wife did a calculation on how much grant funding has been raised for the library under uh, Wilder's uh, watch. And, and I believe it's in excess of a million dollars. I think Council Allen announced uh, at some point, which is just phenomenal. Um, I didn't want uh, I know Wilda has announced her retirement, but I think, you know, after 40 plus years in our municipality, it had to be something that we um, declared publicly. And uh, I know Wilda is so emotional about this. Um, just talking to her, um, she did want to retire earlier, but then COVID hit and her dedication and the passion she has for the library she told me that she just couldn't uh, do it at that time and wanted to see the library through that terrible time and, and was able to pivot and, and get her staff organized. And um, so I just want to wish Wilda the best for the future. I know she's going to have a great retirement. Uh, I know she has many grandchildren that she's looking forward to spending time with. And uh, um, we just you know, collectively salute her for her hard work over those 40 years and, and just wish her the best. Well, thank you, Madam CEO, and uh, definitely all the best for uh, Wilda's retirement uh, at the end of this year. And uh, just as a, a personal note, I, I got to know Wilda uh, just before amalgamation. Um, there was a, a committee made up of the lower tier municipalities uh, with regards to how the library was moving forward. And uh, I was on that committee and uh, along with Wilda and other representatives. So that's going back quite a few years back, but uh, pre-amalgamation, but uh, that's where I, I got. And she was uh, very passionate then about the library and, and continued to be very passionate about uh, the library and its functions and, and about the community itself, just as uh, wholeheartedly as, as, uh, you know, as a lot of other people within our community. So. Uh, she'll have to get reintroduced to her husband, Paul. So uh, as far as spending more time together, right, uh, Mr. Allen? Uh, you're not saying too much there. <laughs> I don't know if there's any other comments uh, at this time from councillors uh, or staff. Uh, all I say is uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, yes. What happened? <laughs> There we go. We still a bit. Yeah, just uh, there's some background noise. Uh, we are in the Gray County Long Term Care Building, and sometimes maintenance issues arise in other areas of the building that you may hear in the background. Okay. Um, sorry. Thank you, Worship. I just I just wanted to mention um, it's been uh, it's been lovely working with uh, Wilda over the last seven years that I've been uh, the council liaison to the library board, and it's it's very evident her passion for library services. And, and to provide the best possible library services on, on what can really only be described as a shoestring uh, budget compared to what, uh, what many other municipalities provide. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's well-deserved. And uh, just to note uh, in there, uh, I knew it was about the same time, but uh, Wilda, has, uh, well, Wilda has been with the uh, Grey Highlands Library for, uh, for significantly longer than I've been alive. So... Uh, <laughs> A well-deserved retirement, and I, and I wish we all the very best. You're here. 
Very good. All right. So um, I don't think there's any other announcements then from that. So moving on to item five on our agenda, then we have the approval of July 21st council meeting, which was the last time we uh, were in council. So would somebody like to move? Councillor Nielsen, second by Councillor Little. Uh, any, are there any errors or omissions on those sets of minutes? Any discussion points? All right, seeing none, all in favor of those? That is carried, okay. And we had a special meeting on uh, August 4th and uh, can I have a mover and seconder for those? Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Allwood. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Those are carried. Okay. So moving on to our delegations, we do have uh, three today. So I'll move along fairly quickly here. And uh, part of that is each delegation has uh, 10 minutes uh, for that. And starting off with, we have uh, Nancy Matthews from the Lake Eugenia Property Association. And uh, good afternoon, Nancy. And we do have a copy of your presentation at that uh, just so if there's certain things you want to add to your presentation, we do have a copy of that on our agenda. There she is. Good afternoon, Nancy. Good afternoon to and thank you uh, to the mayor and the council for allowing me this time to speak. Is my uh, presentation going to be shown uh, or are you looking at it as I speak to it? Thank you. That's perfect. Perfect. Uh, I'm here today because, um, as you know, I represent 380 members uh, who belong to Lake Eugenia Property Owners Association, and we have some very dire concerns about a decline in water quality and environmental things, and some of these are things that Council could help us with. And uh, perhaps we could just go to the next slide and we'll start talking about the problem. Water pollution can happen at all times, but this is the first year that we had E. coli closings every couple of weeks, and it was starting to happen in mid-June when the water was still cool, which is unusual. Um, and the swimming risk is publicized. Uh, blue algae, blue-green algae blooms first started in 2018, and this year we've had someone called the MOE spills line five or six times at week or two week intervals. Uh, fortunately, so far the blooms have not exceeded acceptable toxicity, but if that ever happens, it's very dangerous for people and pets. And we have heavy weed growth, which is adding to both of these problems. And I don't think, I think council will realize that um, any lake that's declared unsafe for recreation um, the tourist attraction is destroyed, and in our case, our property values and your tax base will also be destroyed. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and I guess it's important to cover what the causes are. MOE, MNRF, and GSCA all confirmed to me that the major cause of um, blue-green algae is phosphates and nitrates. That comes from fertilizer, which is used on manic manicured lawns. E. coli can come from the goose population. And the septic system leaching, it's important to understand old or malfunctioning systems um, will leach E. coli. And even a functioning system does not weed out phosphates um, from, from the, uh, in the septic system, and one of the major sources of phosphates is dishwasher detergent. Runoff on the properties from all of those things, as well as acid rain, um, is, is adding, greatly adding to the, the content in the lake. And turf, turf graft does not absorb water. So the picture you're looking at of all the geese Part of the problem is a sloping hill. There's no barrier to keep the geese off and there's no barrier to stop the runoff. And so we, we as an association are encouraging cottagers to do something positive about that. And I'll get to that in a minute, um, but we need those buffers and we need to stop fertilizer. Next slide, please. So what can you as council do? That's what I'm here because sometimes it's not something council can do. First of all, 
we would like to be able to test phosphates in the lake. I talked to John Bittorf at Grace Level Conservation, and he does not have any funding for more testing. But he said since the testing they do do, they do test for phosphates and E. coli at the bridge on 35 side road and at the hydro outflow. And I think he, he said, since you as a municipality or one of your arms is testing the water at the public dock weekly for E. coli, the municipality could very simply uh, authorize the expenditure to also test that, that for phosphates, which would give us a much clearer idea of how much of the phosphate is in fact in the lake as opposed to what's coming in from the river, which is very low. Uh, what bylaws that the municipality could consider to address this problem, mandatory septic inspection. And this is done in many municipalities where there are lakes that are endangered by uh, poor septic systems. And the bylaws can be brought forward to you. In those places that have inspection, there's normally another bylaw if a system fails inspection, then there is, um, there is a requirement for that system to either be repaired or be replaced. Now that can be expensive. We all know these days a septic system is 10, 12, $15,000, depending on what it is. It is quite possible and other municipalities have done this to create an incentive program. So yes, you create a bylaw requiring them to replace it, but then you offer them an interest-free loan over a period of time, which is paid back over that period of time by their tax installments. Uh, and this would be an excellent win-win for both the municipality and for the environment. Um, now it's a biggie to ask to ban fertilizers, especially in agricultural country, uh, but I do know that there are regulations on controlling those um, elements and, and not having them go into water. Uh, even a, a ban of, of the use of fertilizer and herbicides within 300 meters of the shoreline, not just at Lake Eugenia, but around all the lakes and along the river. Um, I checked the Gray Sabo water testing, and if you look all the way down the Beaver River, the outflow at the hydro dam at the valley is fairly low in phosphates, but it gets increasingly higher as that river goes towards Thornbury through agricultural country. And I guess we're asking for this because Lake Eugenia is a local joy, it's a tourist attraction, and it's a very lucrative source of tax revenue. Um, climate change is definitely adding to the problems we're experiencing, but that is why we need help now to protect all the lakes and rivers in this municipality. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to say, re, once again, I did co uh, connect you with, uh, I'm sorry, there's an attachment of an environmental campaign we have sent to all of our cottagers, trying to educate them about the fact that urban lawns and land practices are not appropriate near water. And, um, and we could use in some municipalities, again, the municipality has funded an education system aimed at shoreline restorations, aimed at educating people so that they understand the importance of, of doing something positive and so that they understand the absolute negativity of their impact on the lake. Last thing I saw was about 80% of the negative impact on this lake is from cottage properties. And so the municipality could support us by endorsing um, this uh, environmental campaign and maybe down the line, some of these things could even be enforced. Um, and my final slide, please. Uh, I did today choose to stick strictly with our most serious problem and believe me, it is extremely serious, which is um, are the environment is environmental issues. Um, I do want to take one second. The next thing coming up in a couple of weeks is um, hunting season. And for a long time now, we have not had a bylaw, even though the hunting does take place on OPG land and they are therefore trespassing and not, and not allowed to hunt on those lands south of the lake that belong to OPG. 
Um, and I guess I'll be back another day to talk about some of these other issues. I just wanted to plant their, that idea in council's mind. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, Nancy. And uh, it's always great to get an update on what's happening with Lake Eugenia. Um, I will say that uh, I know a few years back uh, we helped out with the um, uh, with the fish study. I'm trying to think how many years back that was. Now, remember, um, and um, I think eight. it was a very pardon seven or eight years. It's been a while. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know time does fly, and I, I know that was been a very beneficiary of with regards to what was happening there. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions uh, to to councillors. Do any any questions of clarity or or uh, clarity, uh, Councillor Allen? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wondered if there has been any uh, study on the impact of uh, wet exhaust engines on Lake Eugenia. We've all seen the petroleum film that um, is around the exhaust of of motor boats and um, I was going to say sea dews, but I guess it's more personal watercraft. Um, so yeah, has there been any kind of study on that, uh, the impact there? Thank you. I, I haven't seen anything specific to the lake. I know that a Federation of Ontario Cottage Associations is often lobbying about wake. We do suggest, and one of the things that's happening, there are electric motors coming. Um, one of the things that could be done to help the lake would be to ban uh, putting two stroke engines in the lake because they are about a hundred times worse um, at pollution than the, the, the modern four stroke engines. Um, playing in the lake, it's not just cottagers. Lots of cottagers have all kinds of boats, but there's a lot, lot of day traffic um, in and out. And we're actually also concerned about uh, erosion from wakes and there's a lot of unsafe boating. So. Um, you know, you're kind of preaching to the choir here. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Any follow-up to that, Councillor Allen? Um, yeah, I just, I, I guess if, if Council is going to look at um, um, providing assistance, I think we need to be looking at all sources of, of pollution to the lake. And um, as you say, there are a lot of boats. Um, I don't know what the percentage of two stroke as opposed to the electric or the four stroke, but um, yeah, in some kind of uh, bylaw or just a, a general rule for the, the cottage association to, to slowly transfer over to that would be a good start. Thank you. We can't enforce what goes in at the public dock that would have to come from the municipality. Thank you. Okay, are there any other uh, comments or questions from councillors? Councillor Little. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for your presentation, Nancy. Um, I'm just wondering about if you've noticed any uptake on your public awareness campaign for more naturalized shorelines. Um, it seems to be the direction with climate change or green infrastructure and um, so in addition to what, what your organization is, is communicating to your members, there's also, I think, more public awareness. Are you seeing um, a transition to that kind of shoreline work? I am seeing it. It increases all the time. And I apologize because of COVID. Normally, when there's a new council, we take the council around the lake to show them. Because of the COVID restrictions, we've been unable to do that. But at some point, I would love to take council around the lake. And it's amazing how many people, if you have an Etobicoke mentality, you will look at a lovely sloping green lawn without a weed in it and say, isn't that beautiful? And I actually get nauseous looking at a lawn like that because I know how bad it is for the lake. Over the years, people are slowly transitioning. We do have um, flora, um, material flora has come out and done work for people. And, but for everyone that is making an effort and they're planting a buffer of natural plants or hostas or tiger lilies, there's all kinds of things. It, it can be very beautiful. It's just not grass right to the edge of the water. For every one of those, there's somebody, I tried to talk to one of our neighbors who's one of the big offenders and has a big slopey, beautiful lawn that doesn't even have 
you know, a stray, a stray anything in it. And we tried to talk to him, to him about something simple. Planting over with clover really helps the lawn be a lot friendlier. It needs no, he said, clover, oh, that stuff's terrible. That's a weed. I wouldn't want a piece of that in my lawn. I know he's using fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides, but he wants a perfect lawn. He cuts his grass twice a, twice a week in the city and twice a week at home. And so, you know, this guy wants a green lawn and there are other people that are like that and they're not willing to compromise and they don't understand. Right. Okay, well, thanks for that. And I don't know uh, if there's any follow-up to that, Councillor Little or not. Um, Councillor Bellicat, you, you you had a question. Go ahead, Councillor Bellicat, and we'll move thank on. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank and congratulate Ms. Matthews on uh, both coming to Council as well as your advocacy that you do in uh, trying to redefine what is beautiful. Um, it's a lofty goal, and I appreciate that you are attacking it from all angles. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I know a few years. I know a few years ago, uh, Nancy, that uh, we, we had the presentation on how to uh, eradicate phragmites, and we had the, the tour around the lake and how you got to pull it out by the roots. And I know you've been very active on on that as well. So you, you mentioned one thing in your presentation was the possibility of not only testing for E. coli but also testing for phosphate. I, I see we have Director Moyer on the on on here. I don't know if that's a quick question I could ask to him, but is that something that you mentioned, uh, Nancy? That it, uh, just a simple adding that to the testing, and and I don't know if, if Director Moyer is able to answer that, but maybe that's something we can follow up on and what that cost would be, and and uh, if it's just a simple testing. And I'm not sure how often do we test Lake Eugenia, um, the boat launch. Does anybody know on that? Yeah, once a week. Oh, there, there's Sean. Sean, do you have any anything to add with regards to adding that to the testing of, uh, of Lake Eugene, just in the sense of your background? Uh, hi, Council. Uh, the facilities department actually takes and collects the samples for bacteria on Lake Eugenia. So it is a separate bottle that would have to be collected to test for chemical parameters. Uh, the lab that we send it to is licensed to do all that testing, uh, but they would have to carry extra bottles and then there would be uh, an extra bottle in the cooler to be shipped and, and then the cost for the chemical analysis. I don't have the actual cost rate on me, but we do test our wastewater plants for those parameters. So it, it definitely is possible, but it would just be an added cost to the testing. And then somebody would have to analyze the results and summarize everything to uh, make sure we're using that information for something. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sean. I know that you have the background on that water testing and that's why I sort of zeroed in on you on that. So I apologize, but, <laughs> but thanks for that information. It's, it's good to have. So, okay. Seeing there's no other, uh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Director Harris. I go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. It's through you to council. I just wanted to advise that we do check the test the waters weekly and we were able to determine that the extra cost to test for the phosphates would be $12 per week per site. Okay. Well, there's that's that's thanks for that information. That's okay. uh, that's nice to have that offhand. And and so we probably would test what from 24th of May till what? till Thanksgiving or how often do we test every week? Yeah, and I don't have that in front of me, but pre, I think it starts in May and ends at the end of October, but I'm just estimating. Yeah, yeah, that's that's $12 a week. Okay, so that's that's good, good, good knowledge there. Okay, so seeing there's no other questions, uh, can I have a motion to receive the delegation? Councilor Valiquet and Deputy Mayor, uh, all in favor of receiving the delegation? Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Sorry. No worries. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry for interjecting there. I, I, I'm wondering, there was a number of uh, items that were brought up uh, in the uh, in the report, some of which are asking for enforcement, some of which are asking for, uh, for in a way, budgetary contributions. Um, would it be wise to uh, to request a staff report to uh, to investigate the feasibility of it? Um, so that there's there's action coming out of the delegation rather than mm -hmm. uh, the delegation just being received for information. So, uh, so 
I guess going back to the original mover, uh, Councillor Valaket, are you, uh, I know that the mayor second it, but then as the pause, uh, uh, I can go back to you, Councillor Valaket, start with that as the recommendation or the suggestion from Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, so I actually, this was the avenue that I was gonna take. I had taken a bunch of notes down of um, staff members that I had a couple questions and, and, and I agree with the deputy mayor's assessment that um, there potentially could be some action items for staff that fall out of it. I guess I personally wanted to do a little bit more research before I put that forward. Perhaps the, the deputy uh, mayor feels differently though. Okay, so you, your position was you were just going to move it for today, but uh, Deputy Mayor, I, you were looking at seconding this, but then you sort of interjected. So I'm not sure if I have a second or not. Thank you, Rich. No, I'm, I'm happy to second and we'll, I, I believe Councilor Valaket okay. will come back with something. Okay, so just to be clear, the motion on the floor right now, move by Councilor Valaket, second by Deputy Mayor, that we'll receive it for information uh, from the delegation. Any further discussion on that? Seeing that, all in favor? That's carried. Okay, thank you. Okay. Shows that we have a mask. <laughs> um, so moving on then to our second delegation for today as uh, the Ontario Clean Alliance, uh, Jack Gibbons. And is uh, Jack, are you able to uh, come up to the forum here to uh, speak uh, virtually? Good afternoon, Jack. Mr. Hello, Gibbons, Mayor you? McQueen. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can see uh, from your glasses up. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there you are. That's much better. Great. Good afternoon. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mayor McQueen and members of council for the opportunity to talk with you uh, this afternoon about the need to, uh, to phase out our gas-fired power plants by 2030. I'm Jack Gibbons from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. The Clean Air Alliance was established in 1997 to promote the phase out of Ontario's dirty coal-fired power plants. And we worked on that issue for uh, 17 years until the, uh, the last coal plant was phased out in 2014. And now we're working on the second step to clean up our electricity system uh, by phasing out the, the, the gas-fired power plants in order to create a 100% carbon-free electricity grid for Ontario. Next slide, please. Now this slide shows the historic and forecast greenhouse gas pollution from our electric power plants. And it starts in 2005 and it goes to 2040. And the good news is that thanks to the coal uh, uh, power plant phase out, the greenhouse gas pollution from our power plants fell by 93% between 2005 and 2017. But since 2017, the, the pollution from our power plants has started to rise again. And according to the IESO or Independent Electricity System Operator, the pollution from our gas plants is forecast to rise by more than 300% by 2040 and by, sorry, more than 300% by 2030 and by 500% or more by 2040. And if this occurs, we'll lose about 40% of the pollution reduction benefits that we achieve by phasing out the dirty coal plants. Next slide, please. Now there's three main reasons why the IESO is forecasting this big increase in, in pollution. The first reason is that they're forecasting that our demand for electricity will grow by about 1% a year. The second reason is that they're forecasting that the Pickering Nuclear Station will close in 2025. And the third reason is that the Government of Ontario is planning to meet virtually all of our need for new electricity by simply ramping up the output of our gas fired power plants. That is, they're gonna meet our need for uh, new electricity by importing more fracked gas from Western Canada and Pennsylvania 
and simply cranking up the output of our gas-fired power plants. Next slide, please. Now, as I'm sure you know, the government of Ontario has a climate target. It's to reduce our greenhouse gas pollution by 30% by 2030. But according to the Auditor General, we're not on track to, to achieving that target. But here's the good news. If we phase out the gas-fired power plants, that will give us all or virtually all of the extra pollution reductions we need to achieve Ontario's 2030 climate target. So that's why we're promoting the phase out of our gas-fired power plants because it's the easiest and lowest cost option for Ontario uh, to meet its 2030 climate target. Next slide, please. Now we're promoting a three-pronged strategy to phase out the gas-fired power plants. The first prong is to, to invest in energy efficiency to reduce the demand for electricity and hence the need for the gas plants. The second prong is to import more low cost water power from Quebec. Quebec has a huge surplus of power from its existing hydro facilities. And most of the surplus is now exported to the US, mostly on the spot market, mostly at very low prices. So some of these exports could be diverted to Ontario to help us uh, phase out our gas fired power plants. And the third prong is to start investing in wind and solar energy again. Now we all know that wind and solar used to be uh, very high cost sources of electricity. But the good news is that thanks to technological progress, wind and solar are now our lowest cost sources of new electricity supply. Next slide, please. An additional good news, by investing in energy efficiency and wind and solar energy, we can create jobs in, jobs in every single community in Ontario. On the other hand, if we meet our needs simply by importing more fracked gas from Western Canada and Pennsylvania, we will create zero new jobs in Ontario. Now we all know that the, sorry, we all know that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So wind and solar do need a backup or storage option. And that's why Ontario is so lucky to be located right next door to the province of Quebec, because Quebec's huge hydroelectric reservoirs can act like a giant battery for our wind and solar energy. So by integrating our wind and solar with Quebec's hydroelectric reservoirs, we can convert intermittent wind and solar energy into a firm 24 seven source of baseload electricity for Ontario. Next slide, please. And going forward, there's another great storage option uh, for our wind and solar energy. And that's, and that's the batteries of our electric vehicles. Electric vehicles have, have batteries and electric vehicles are parked for about 95% of the hours of the day. And when they're parked, they can be, they can be used as, as, as to, to store surplus energy from our wind and solar. And then uh, the batteries can provide power back to the grid during peak demand hours to help us uh, phase out our gas-fired power plants. Next slide, please. Now this slide um, uh, shows the costs of Ontario's carbon-free electricity options. And the lowest cost options are on the left-hand side. And the good news is that the options that we are promoting are the lowest cost options to phase out the gas-fired power plants. And to see that, I, I direct your attention to the yellow bar graph in the middle with 9.6 cents on top of it. That's the price we're paying for nuclear electricity today to Ontario power generation. But if you look to the left, you can see that energy efficiency, Quebec water power, solar power, and onshore wind power are all substantially lower cost than the price we're paying for nuclear, nuclear electricity today. Next slide, please. And I'm really pleased to tell you that so far 30 municipalities have passed resolutions calling on the province to, to phase out our gas-fired power plants. And these 30 municipalities represent more than 50% of the population of Ontario. And they stretch all the way from Windsor in the west to Kingston in the east 
and Sault Ste. Marie in the north. Next slide, please. And I'm also pleased to note that President Biden has promised to, to, uh, to phase out all fossil fuel generation in the US uh, uh, by 2035, all fossil fuel electricity generation phased out by 2035. And that's a very challenging target for the US because at the present they get 62% of their electricity from fossil fuels. Now in Ontario, we're very lucky at the moment we only get 6% of our, of our electricity from fossil fuels. So we can definitely achieve a complete phase of, of the gas plants by 2030, five years in advance of the US. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, Mayor McQueen and, and members of council, we hope that Gray Highlands will also pass a, a motion requesting the province of Ontario to phase out our gas fired power plants by 2030 to help Ontario and Gray Highlands achieve their climate targets. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. Well, well thank you, Jack. And, and thanks for the great uh, presentation you did to uh, provide us today. Um, I'm gonna go to, are there any questions, uh, clarity or whatever? Uh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, the one interesting uh, point that Mr. Gibbons has brought up is with regards to uh, the wind energy, wind and solar rather. Um, Grey Highlands, as we know, has, has long declared itself an unwilling host to, uh, to industrial wind turbines. Uh, my question is, how, how do we reconcile the fact that we have declared ourselves to be an unwilling host uh, with um, also asking for increased contributions uh, to the grid from industrial wind turbines? Um, the other question I had is um, there has been uh, the suggestion that we could use uh, uh, storage facilities for, for extra power. Um, there is the TC Energy proposal in, in Meaford uh, that has received significant pushback from the community there. Um, so th th there, there's pushback on, on that as well. There's been pushback on the IWTs. And, and then finally, if God forbid at a, at a certain point in time, Quebec decides that no longer wants to sell power to Ontario because it needs that power or it wants that power, where does that leave us? Um, I'm not for one second arguing, Mr. Gibbons, that we we need to uh, lobby the government to move away from the uh, from the gas plants. Uh, what I am arguing, though, is that we we should have uh, made in Ontario um, replacements uh, for those gas plants, uh, whether that's nuclear or uh, solar or even even wind in communities that are willing to use that. Um, but that 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 is the point I'm getting to. Um, so if if um, if you could, I guess, answer the how do we reconcile um, increased um, contribution from IWTs when we have a, ourselves declared ourselves an unwilling host, and you know when there's pushback to other uh, proposals as well, uh, is there really a way forward for a made in Ontario plan? Thank you. I thank you for that question, Mr. Gibbons. Do you care to answer those uh, or make a yes, comment? Yes, those, those, those are great questions. Thank you. And so what we're asking you is to, uh, to call for a phase out of the gas-fired power plants. We happen to think uh, wind is, is a very cost-effective and, and good solution, but we're not asking you uh, to endorse wind power for, for, for Grey Highlands. Uh, we believe that each municipality should uh, uh, make their own decisions about whether or not they want wind and if your municipality doesn't want wind, uh, that's fine. There's many other communities who will be glad to accept wind and will be glad to the, the jobs that go with wind and the extra tax base that goes with wind. So, so to achieve a, a, a gas plant phase out, we don't need to build wind turbines in municipalities that, are, that don't want them. Uh, so that's the first response. In, in terms of a Quebec water power, Yes, it comes from outside of Ontario, but you've got to remember that uh, all of our, our, our gas now that we're using in the gas plants comes from outside of Ontario. And, and, the, and the uranium for our nuclear power plants comes from Saskatchewan, comes from outside of Ontario. So for years, we've imported uh, fossil, fossil fuels from outside of Ontario. We've imported uranium from outside of Ontario. 
And, and, if, and if that's being okay, uh, we believe it's also okay to, to in, import clean renewable power from Quebec, our, our next door neighbor. And I would point out to you, uh, sir, that the city of Cornwall has, has obtained 100% of their electricity from Hydro-Quebec for 50 years. And, and the city of Cornwall has the lowest electricity rates of any city in Ontario. And during the 2003 blackout, the lights didn't go out in the city of Cornwall. So uh, Hydro-Quebec is a, is a very uh, high quality and low cost uh, a source of renewable power. We think it makes sense for, for Ontario to import it, both to help clean up our environment and to give uh, lower electricity rates for homeowners and businesses. Now, have I answered your question or were there other elements to it that I've missed? Uh, no. Uh, the, the one question that I did have was what happens if Quebec decides no longer wants to sell, but you've, I, I appreciate your, uh, your example of Cornwall and the 50, 50 year history that they have uh, with Hydro Quebec. So I do appreciate your answers. Thank you. I yes. So, sir, if I can just, uh, uh, just, just make one more comment about, about Quebec. Like the city of Cornwall has long-term contracts with Quebec, and that's what we're advocating for Ontario. We shouldn't be buying our, our power from Quebec just on the spot market. We should have long-term contracts, like 20-year contracts, to, to guarantee that the power will, will, will continue to flow to Ontario. And, and back in 2017, that's what Hydro-Quebec offered us, was a 20-year contract at a price of only $0.05 cents a kilowatt hour. And unfortunately, the government of the day didn't seize that great opportunity. Thank you for that. I have Councillor Allwood has a question. Go ahead, Councillor Allwood. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to, uh, the, to Mr. Gibbons. Thank you for that presentation. I'd like to uh, remind everybody that total electricity production in Ontario is responsible for 2% of the, uh, the carbon issues that we have. And uh, as uh, Mr. Gibbons pointed out, um, in 2020, we, uh, 7% of that total capacity of, for generating electricity was done with gas. So although it's admirable to uh, look at phasing out gas as a fossil fuel source, um, it, it's only a small part of the bigger problem that we have in Ontario. And, I, and I'd just like to speak about um, the IESO basically um, auctions off any um, annually, I believe, any capacity, any issues they have for capacity. So if uh, Hydro-Quebec was able to sell us um, power at those prices, uh, the government of the day decided that rather than uh, opt for lower prices, uh, and perhaps it had to do with transmission capabilities, I'm not sure of it, you know, the, the Green Energy Act that uh, took the uh, um, wind turbine decisions out of municipalities uh, resulted results in Ontario paying some of the highest prices in North America for electricity. And, you know, I chair a multiple municipal wind turbine working group, uh, and there are several issues with wind turbines and setbacks and health issues that need to be addressed. Uh, along with its, uh, you know, the environmental friendly aspects of wind turbine electricity production. But again, I'd like to thank Mr. Gibbons for his presentation. We've, we've got lots of work to do with uh, reducing our carbon footprint and uh, certainly the gas fired. Um, you know, Ontario does have 23% of its electricity producing capacity in gas fire plants, but they use that for reliability and flexibility. Um, I'm, uh, my one question to Mr. Gibbons would be, uh, if we were to significantly increase um, buying power from uh, um, hydro sources in Quebec, do we have the transmission uh, capabilities to, uh, to do that, to connect it to the grid and distribute it throughout Ontario? Uh, yes, yes, sir, we do. At the moment, we've got seven interconnections with the province of Quebec, electrical interconnections. And at the moment, uh, we're, we're not um, importing the maximum amount of power from Quebec that we could. With the existing transmission lines, we could, we could triple our power imports from Quebec tomorrow. And, and so there, there's a lot more we could do and that could help us uh, dr dramatically reduce the amount of uh, gas fire generation we, we, we use today. 
but but your your point is is also true uh, that to get the full benefit of Qu Quebec water power in terms of environmental benefit and, and lower uh, electricity rates for consumers, we do also we should also be building new transmission lines with Quebec, and there's certainly a, a lot of potential to do that to upgrade the transmission lines. And the good news is the the ISO has identified options, four options to expand our transmission links with Quebec uh, at for a total of 7,500 megawatts. And all of these upgrades would use existing Hydro One transmission corridors. So we wouldn't have to create new transmission corridors. So that means it's a relatively easy task to do. So, so we can do that. And, and I just in respect to one of the other points you made, yeah, it's true at the moment we, we get 6% of our electricity uh, from gas, uh, but, but the government of Ontario was planning to, to dramatically increase the amount of, of electricity we get from gas by, uh, to raise it to about 24% of our electricity supply by uh, 2040. And we believe that's going in the wrong direction and that we need to one of the, the easiest ways to start reducing our greenhouse gas pollution is to, is to move Ontario to a carbon-free electricity grid. But you're absolutely right. We also have to reduce greenhouse gas pollution from all the other sectors of our economy too. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, it sort of make, it does make sense if you're creating electric cars, it doesn't make sense to make electricity out of a, of a fossil fuel to run electric cars if that's your, your model. So it certainly makes sense to, to move to a, a cleaner uh, source of electricity. I know just on the other day on CPC, they were talking about a contractor on there. I think, uh, I'm not sure where he's from, but there's more and more building materials that are coming out that are, are uh, solar um uh, pr producing or electric electrical producing and even even uh, slate and and uh, different types of stone looking material it's, it's in the northern okay. it's, changing. it's changing quickly it's changing quickly so and just as a side we do have a, a lake in in our municipality called lake eugenia that is also producing hydro that has been doing it for 100 years so uh, we, we look at that as something that we see that as a benchmark and we certainly appreciate your comments uh today and uh now, I don't have any other comments, but what's your direction from council? Um, I have a motion here to receive as the delegation at this point. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Nielsen, do I have a seconder? Councillor Valiquette, or was it Councillor Valiquette? I think you had your hand up there, didn't you? Yeah. So Councillor Nielsen, Councillor Valiquette, any discussion on receiving this for uh, information? Seeing that, all in favor? That is carried. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to uh, item 6.3. Three on our delegation uh, forum here uh, with planning partnership. And we have uh, Donna Hinda and Wa Ying the I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> the Georgia, the Georgia, oh, sorry about that. The presentation of the Beaver Valley Corridor Visioneering Report. And uh, Donna, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You did a very good job on that pronunciation, by the way. I appreciate the, the um, comment. <laughs> If I could have our presentation, I'll load it up and is everyone seeing it? I, I'm not seeing it on my screen. Donna, you can, you have the capability of sharing your screen. Do you want you me wish. to do it instead? Sure. Okay, great. I will Thank do you. that instead. Um, let me just put it. Um, A blank slate. And here we go. Are we seeing it now? Yeah, there we are. Okay. Beautiful Beaver Valley. Great. And did my I'm not seeing Waying. Are you on the are you on the call as well, Waying? Hopefully she will be joining shortly. Okay, I am going to get started. Um, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity first to assist the Beaver, the municipality with the Beaver Valley Corridor Visioning exercise. We're really happy today to present the results of our community outreach. Uh, the exercise, as you know, was specifically focused on the Beaver Valley, the area outlined in red on this image that's you're show, seeing it obviously within the regional context of the entire Niagara escarpment that stretches right from Tobermory <clears throat> to Niagara. 
The Beaver Valley, oh, let me just back up one more time. The Beaver Valley uh, corridor is guided by the policies of the Niagara Escarpment Plan. It's one of the most prescri prescriptive pieces of planning legislation in Ontario. It protects the geologic and the ecological features of the escarpment. That plan establishes a framework of objectives and policies to balance development, protection, and enjoyment of the features and resources that everyone enjoys of the escarpment. So we were asked to help the municipality to do everything we could to in involve the community to help develop a vision and some guiding principles for development and planning in the Beaver Valley Corridor. So we used multiple tools and venues. We uh, conducted a pre-workshop survey. We had workshops. We received lots of input through email. And then we followed up with a post-workshop survey to just reach out and connect based on the input that we got at the workshops. We started off with planning for four workshops, we added another two. So we had in total six workshops. We had about 400 people join one of those six workshops. It was tremendous input. Had about 12 hours of conversation received over the course of the exercise in the order of 50 emails. When we did our pre-workshop survey, we had 140 responses to that. And those that survey was sent out to anyone who registered for the workshop. I might say that, I uh, must say that um, about 400, and, sorry, 550 people registered for those workshops. And in the end, we had 400 people that logged on. Hundreds of ideas. And then we did that follow-up workshop and we had a, in the order of 345 people that responded to that. Um, all of that uh, input received from the workshops and the emails and the, and the surveys helped us prepare this draft vision statement that I put before council today, that the Beaver Valley Corridor as a significant ecological system in the heart of Grey Highlands will be a model of the best practices in sustainable ecological and environmental pursuits in support of the long-term social, cultural, and economic vitality of the community for generations. The input that we received also helped us uh, develop four fundamental pillars or principles that should direct planning and design in the corridor. And those principles or pillars are to respect and value the natural and cultural and rural environment, to build a better community for all, to create a strong and sustainable uh, economy, and to create a management plan. Um, I want, Waiying and I want to thank you very much and to everyone who participated in the surveys, the workshops, who took time to submit emails for their help in helping us uh, craft the draft vision and principles that we put before council today. That concludes our uh, presentation. Okay, there may be some questions there, Donna. And, uh... Uh, I know that uh, you're quite engaging to the, to the community and uh, not just for the Beaver Valley, but also for the visionary session for downtown Markdale, which we have gone through that. And we, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for all that work that you have done and uh, have a listening ear for sure. Are there uh, comments, questions from uh, councillors on uh, with regards to this report? Somebody to make a comment or... Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Councillor Little, go ahead. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Donna. I think the uh, the exercise was obviously very well attended, and uh, people participated. And I know from comments I've heard that it was very well received as as well. So thank you for uh, for doing such an exemplary job. Um, just have a question about the vision statement itself. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes um, word choice, um, we're not always on the same page about what words actually mean. And I'm just, I'm, a, I'm just a little bit, um, 
I guess wondering about the part that the, um, the corridor will be a model of best practices in sustainable ecological and environmental pursuits. Um, and I'm, you know, I can, I can sort of figure out what that means. I just wondered what the intent was for that part of the vision statement. Um, best part of sustainable ecological and environmental pursuits. Well, we heard a lot in the workshops, and maybe I'll get why in to put your mic on too, about initiatives, um, sustainable initi initiatives, like doing a management plan. And we had terrific response to the questions we put out on our survey um, with respect to the management plan in particular, and other questions about who should manage specific elements and attractions in the in the corridor. So those are the kinds of things that we were thinking about when we when we use that word pursuits. Why Ying? Do you have any other clarity well, on no, that? No, I would I would say no. That's I um, much more added that's to that. Um, definitely okay. is about the balancing act. Is you know we've heard lots from sort of um, uh, the well-attended events that talked a little bit about uh, the preservation and protection of the area, but also um, things about su supporting a, a local economy and the vitality of the, of the economy. So the pursuits is really, uh, from our perspective, an all-encompassing catch word, a catch phrase to, uh, to um, account for all of that, that wide spectrum. Uh, sorry, but that was very difficult to hear. And then we weren't seeing you when you were speaking either. So um, oh. I'm just wondering if you could, you know, uh, maybe difficult, but could you repeat what you just said, please? Yeah. Um, when we refer to pursuits, um, and because we've heard a lot in terms of the broad range of things that people provided us with in terms of their thoughts and their, their aspirations for the area, it was meant to be a uh, all-encompassing word uh, to capture things about not only the recreational aspect, uh, but also the long-term management and development within the area. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I know it was a little hard to hear you and thank you for repeating that, uh, your uh, opinion on those words and that. Uh, any other comments, uh, questions? Um, I know that uh, it was something that uh, we were certainly waiting to, to see this report and uh, and also was the public itself. And I know the, the engagement part, especially during a COVID uh, <laughs> shutdown, it, it, I think it was remarkable for the amount of uh, participants and and uh, and how you were able to uh, get those involved. And I think that that's, that's even meeting a, a certain plateau in the sense of getting that input, you know, especially with the, the way things were. So, uh, any further comments then do you have or, or? Uh, not from not from us okay all right so uh, seeing there's no other comments then I, I know okay. that uh, a lot of it's self-explanatory oh Councillor Alwyn do you wish to make a comment I was going to move that we uh, received the uh, delegation from the planning partnership for information your worship okay do I have a second or Councillor Little uh, any any further discussion on those that uh, receiving that for information? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. I'm going to suggest what time we got here. We're just about two thirteen. Do you want to keep going? Do you want to take a five minute stretch? What do you want to do? I know. Ten minute break, sir. Okay. Why don't we come back at? Uh, can we come back at twenty after two? That's like six minutes. Does that does that work? Here and just before we leave. Protocol, Madam Deputy, Madam Clerk, just in a sense for us here. Uh, certainly, as soon as anybody gets up from their space, their actual workspace in, by the uh, plexiglass barriers, everybody in the room has to put their mask on and the masks must remain on until all are back seated at the workspaces, at which point they can come off again. And we maintain our distance, right? Yes. Okay, we'll see you at uh, roughly 20 after two. Thank you. Please, please shut your screen. Oh, oh, oh dear. <laughs> Put a mask on.
Item 7.1, uh, the Beaver Valley Cor uh, Corridor Visioning Report. And there's a motion there. Would somebody care to move it or have a have an alternate motion? Councillor Little, you're moving that as written, or do you have a comment? Uh, I'd just like to divide the question, Your Worship. Um, sure. To separate the um, the last uh, clause to adopt the proposed vision statement and just deal with the. I would move to receive the report and the um, Planning Partnerships Beaver Valley Corridor Visioning Report. And so you wish to split that out. So do I need a seconder for the first part of that uh, division? Councillor Nielsen. Okay, any discussion on that portion of the uh, motion? Seeing none, all in favor of that? Okay, that's carried. I can see it from the side, Deputy Mayor, so it's good. <laughs> all right, so the second part, uh, I'm gonna go back to you, Councillor Little, because you did have it wish to be separated. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass the floor back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would um, move that we defer this to the next council meeting. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot to digest in the planning partnerships report, um, especially through the appendix. And um, I would like, personally, I'd like to have time to consider the vision statement um, after going through their report and uh, move towards adoption at the next council meeting. Okay, so procedurally then um, to have this deferred to the next council meeting, does that need to be written in that part of the motion, Madam Clerk? It's just a motion to defer your worship. So the motion would be that uh, the second part of the recommendation stating that Sorry, I'm just in the middle of it. That council adopt the proposed visioning statement for the Beaver Valley Corridor as presented as a guiding principle be deferred to the next council meeting. Okay, Council Little is moving that. Do I have a second or Councilor Nielsen, you're seconding that? Okay. Uh, since there's no discussion on deferral, let me refresh my mind. Yes, sir. Okay, any discussion on that deferral? All right, and it's so does it need to be written in there to the next council meeting or to an upcoming council meeting? I think you refer to it as a next council meeting. Is that how you capture that, ma'am? Okay, all right, so that's for the next uh, upcoming. So just before we pass or go to vote on that, so what kind of, are you looking at just more time, Councilor Little, just for everyone in council sort of to reflect on that visioning and then come back for a further discussion at that council meeting? Um. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's a pretty meaningful um, statement that we're coming forward with the vision for the Beaver Valley Corridor and um, and I don't think it should be done um, hastily. So I would appreciate the the time before the next council meeting to to um, to be able to review that statement and also review the supporting documentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Any other discussion on the deferral? Seeing none, all in favor of that? Keep your hands up. Okay, that's approved. Thank you for that. That's carried. So then, yeah, so that's two weeks from now. So uh, moving on to item 7.2, this is with regards to the Burnside Park, uh, Parkette rehabilitation. Uh, does anybody wish to move the suggested motion? Councillor Little? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Valaket. So I'll go back to reading that. That council receives, moved by Councillor Little, second by Councillor Valaket. That council receives report ECD 2130 for information and that council approve allocating 30,000 from the Markdale Hydro Reserve to support the rehabilitation of the Burnside Parkette in downtown Markdale and that council approve the municipality entering into a funding agreement with FedDev Ontario for approved funding from the Canada Community Revitalization Fund in the amount of $121,400. Discussion, I don't know if you uh, wish to have any comments from our Director of, uh, of uh, Economic Development, but uh, who would like to, is there a question from Councillor Little? Go ahead. I was just going to speak to it, Your Worship. Um, I, I fully support this um, initiative. Um, I think we're always encouraging um, staff to look for funding opportunities, grant opportunities, and um, and this was certainly a, a good one and, and good news that they were successful. I believe um, it supports the downtown 
visioning exercise that we went through for Markdale, um, providing or sprucing up that area that provides a linkage to parking behind the, you know, the main street. And um, uh, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot, lost my train of thought there, but um, it is right now a bit of an eyesore. It, it certainly needs some sprucing up. And so um, I think this is um, moving forward with the direction that we're going with downtown improvement. And uh, that's why I'm supportive. Okay, thank you for that. I have Councillor Nielsen wants to speak next. Go ahead, Councillor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to echo Councillor Little. I think that uh, through the CIP, we've been encouraging businesses to uh, spruce up their storefronts. We are encouraging um, businesses to invest in our downtown core, and it's the municipality's opportunity to do the same. Uh, the fact that we're able to get some extra funding to help support so that we can do a greater scale project to have the park at um, rehabilitated further than the initial plan is fantastic. Uh, it does support the initiatives that the municipality is taking and trying to um, work uh, for upgrading our downtown cores. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see this project move forward. Okay. Any, any further comments from council? I don't know if uh, Director Harris has anything to add. I don't think there's any questions uh, asking for that there. So uh, it's been moved by moved and second. If all those in favor of the motion. That's carried. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item 7.3, Osprey Arena ice resurfacing lease. Uh, there's in the report, there's some concerns about the old Zamboni. Uh, would somebody wish to move that motion? or have further discussion on what's on there. Councillor Nielsen, Deputy Mayor, just gonna look, keep looking to my left and right. Um, any comments, discussion on the report? We're pretty straightforward as the report of this problem with the old ones. So this buys us to it some time till we have the recreational plan in place. Seeing there's no discussion, all in favor of that report. That is carried. Moving on to 7.4, recreational master plan. Uh, this is uh, for uh, 29,960, Somebody care to move that motion or have other comments? Deputy Mayor? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Little? Any discussion with regards to that report in that direction? Councillor Nelson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a comment. Um, the original direction was kind of hoping to have the recreation master plan for December 31st of this year. And I'm actually um, pleased to see that it's been extended. I think um, this kind of a project deserves to have the time to make sure it's done properly. And um, I think there's a, there's a lot of questions around recreation in Great Highlands with the facilities that we have in place and what we might be wanting to do in the future. Um, so I'm, I was excited to see that there was more time given than the initial uh, two months. Good. Yep, that makes sense. Any further discussion from, go ahead, Councillor Little. Thank you, Worship. Um, just a question for staff, and I'm sorry I didn't ask this uh, earlier, but um, in the scope, it talks about <clears throat> uh, municipally owned properties and um, facilities and halls and things like that, and also amenities. And I just wondered if amenities include um, recreation areas such as Lake Eugenia, which is not owned by the municipality, but is used by its residents. That's one question. And do amenities include um, other properties in the municipality that are not municipally owned? For example, the Crown land and conservation authority lands. Does this, um, does this master plan um, include looking, the scope include looking at those amenities that are not specifically municipally owned. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'll go to Director Harris. Thank you so much, um, Mayor McQueen, through you to Council. It most certainly does. Obviously, our responsibility is for our municipal assets, but a recreation master plan needs to look at the entire community, as well as adjacent um, municipalities and 
agencies and one of the deliverables in the RFP was to identify opportunities for collaboration with other municipalities, level of government, external agencies, stakeholders to enhance our opportunities for our residents. And um, when we interviewed this proponent, proponent actually, we talked a lot about that and certainly as we're seeing trends in recreation, um, traditional master plans, I was just to talk primarily about arenas and I and we really liked this firm's approach that you know we need to as much consider our outdoor assets and the adjacent assets so all of that will be um, will help formulate I believe the recommendations in the plan. Okay thank you for that I saw I saw Director Lemon pop up on the screen there for a few minutes and uh, <laughs> any uh, so any follow-up to that uh, Councillor Lowe? Sorry, Arisha. Um, no, that's great. Thank you very much. Very good. Well, certainly lots of inter inter intricacies uh, with regards to a lot to do with recreation, for sure. Any further uh, questions to that report? Seeing none, all in favor? All right, that's carried. <clears throat> uh, I didn't read the report, though. Uh, moving on. Noise 7.5 with regards to the noise control bylaw amendment um with regards to some latitude with regards to businesses and uh restaurants and therefore would somebody care to move that motion councillor nielsen do i have a second here councillor veliquette deputy mayor you have a question you uh your worship um my question is for you to clerk martel um is this is this simply a housekeeping item that we have to um uh pass or is this a um is this something that we can discuss, debate, and then perhaps uh, come to a different decision? Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. So um, if we don't add this to our bylaw, it is still fully enforceable because it is provincial legislation. We are noting it in our bylaw, so there's no confusion with what's in our bylaw versus what the provincial legislation is. We cannot change it because it is overarching provincial legislation. It's almost like applicable law, right? Okay, any further questions there? I'll re Pardon me, I didn't read the other ones, but the move by Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Valaket, that Council receive staff report CLS 2130, and that Council direct staff to bring forward an amendment to our bylaw 2018-063 to include an additional general exemptions for the delivery of goods to, to retail business establishments, restaurants, cafes, and bars, hotels, motels, and goods distributing facilities as per legislation to come into effect on September 19, 2021. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Moving on to item 7.6, sale of uh, surplus lands uh, with regards to 20, uh, 222 Pallister, Pallister Street, a road allowance, Eugenia. So there is a request there. Um, there is a, a resolution that is suggested there. What's your wish, uh, Councilor Nielsen? I would like to move the motion as written, as well as the further direction for staff to enter into agreement. So as written, okay, so Councilor Nielsen, do I have a seconder that supports that uh, direction? Councilor Valaket. So move by Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Valaket, that Council receives report CLS, CLS 2131, sale of surplus land request 222 Pallister Street Road Allowance, Eugenia, and that Council deny the request to dispose of the of the Cargan Street road allowance between Pallister Street and the Simpson Street road allowance as the road allowance may be required for future needs and that council direct staff to enter into an agreement with the owners of 222 Pallister, Pallister Street related to uses of an unopened road allowance as a driveway. Any further discussion there? There's a good map on the report. Seeing that, all in favor of that? And it's carried. Right, uh, item 7.7 .7 with regards to uh, canine control bylaw update two. There's a recommendation there. What's your wish, Council? Somebody care to move the motion that's recommended? Councillor Little, Do have a seconder. Seconder. Councillor Nielsen. It's like all right, so moved by Council Little, second by Council Nielsen, that Council receives staff report CLS 2132 K9 uh, control bylaw update two, and that 
Council directs staff to bring forward an amendment to bylaw 21071 to amend section 1.1 in bracket V, uh, which is 5, uh, 8.4 and 1.1B. Any further discussion to that? And I guess that'll come fairly soon, Madam Clerk. Seeing there's no other discussion, all in favor of that motion. That is carried. All right, just moving along here. Item 7.8. This was a motion that was deferred from our last council meeting. And what's your wish then is as council? I think Councillor Valiquette, I know that you were reaching out to everyone. I don't know if you wish to address this motion or I'm not trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Thank you, sir. I'll uh, I'll take the part. Um, yes. So, sorry, I'm getting my uh, my post notes up here. So essentially, uh, this is uh, related to a motion that uh, was deferred uh, last time around. I reached out to as the environmental liaison liaison to remind council that this essentially is uh, an ask to help better implement a um, decision that was ratified in March of 2017 by a previous council and um, quasi endorsed by us uh, in uh, the last budget by not, um, uh, not having a scale there. I uh, ask that uh, council will um, will continue forward on this path and give uh, give the support needed to um, uh, to a to a department that hasn't had a lot of traction lately, and and I think um, I think would really appreciate uh, being provided with clear direction. Thank you, sir. Are you moving that motion? I will do that, sir. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? So this is the continuation. No. Deputy Mayor, you're, you're seconding that. I'll read the motion. Count, moved by Councilor Valiquette, seconded by Deputy Mayor, that Council direct staff to limit the Artemisia and Osprey transfer site to accepting diversion material and bag household waste only as of September 1st. But as that, as that date is today, <laughs> I don't know if there needs to be an amendment. Councilor Valiquette. Um, sir, I would, and perhaps Director Moore would like to speak to this, but my... Um, my reaction to that is, is that's fine leaving the date. This is a, um, this, this motion has gotten a little befuddled, um, and this is a process that is currently in place. What they ask was essentially was for documentation and signage to be able to, for staff to support the, um, the request of a previous council. Okay, so September 1st is, is okay with you and the mover? Okay, thank you for that clarification. Discussion. Uh, discussion on this motion. Any discussion? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did get a call on uh, this item uh, from a resident of Ar the former Artemisia. Um, their comment, two comments. One was we've had this service for decades and if the residents um, feel they want and need this service, then um, why not keep it if they're willing to pay for the service? Um, another comment was that some of the things, some of the services that um, we're losing in Gray Highlands there's not a reduction in taxes. It, we're losing things, but taxes keep going up and up. And because they use the base, we use the base price or base budget for the next year, whatever was budgeted prior years is included in future budgets. And the other, another comment they made was the impact on the environment. If I don't know how many trucks, and perhaps that um, this question could be answered by the director. If there's one truck going from Artemisia to uh, Markdale, one a week, one every two weeks, whatever that number is, then is that better for the environment than 
30 people driving from around Flesherton, um, Maxwell, down almost to, well, right into Badgerows and having to drive all the way to Markdale to dispose of large bulky items. Um, the, another comment or a comment that I have is that, yes, this is from a previous council, but they also in that same report um, said about a report on hazardous waste and also um, the hours changing Artemisia from uh, Saturdays and Mondays to Sundays. There are two notices of motion out there that have not been addressed. Uh, those two have not been addressed. Um, the hazardous waste and also the uh, deputy mayor's notice of motion to look at another day for the Artemisia landfill to be open. So yes, this is previous direction from, or direction from previous council, but um, has not been acted on. And that a lot of that council's gone. We're the council now. And I think we should be having a say in, in, in um, changes to services that are going to affect our residents. Thank you. So, so just, just to follow up with you, Councillor Allen, you made some comments, but are you suggesting something out of those comments or are you just going to hold the comments for now? And I'm not trying to make you say anything. I just, you were sort of saying some statements there and I wasn't sure where you're leading those. I'm just, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm just stating what I've heard from people. They want this service and um, I wonder to see how my vote will be going. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Other comments? Uh, Councillor Nielsen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a question for staff. So the motion in question is saying, uh, is applying to both the Artemisia and the Osprey transfer sites. Um, one of the comments is the, the fact that this council didn't endorse putting a scale at the Osprey site, but we do have a scale at the Artemisia site. Um, so why is it that we're having the same implementation saying that Artemisia, who has a scale where we could weigh the materials coming in and out, would still have the same process where only bagged and uh, diversion materials there. Just asking for staff to answer that. So I guess I'll go to Sean. And if Sean, did you hear the question? You, did you hear the question or do you want to repeat it? No, uh, I heard the question and through you to Councillor Nielsen. Uh, so the point of having oh, one a scale. Moment, Sean, Director Moyer. Your sound is really garbled. <laughs> Sorry, is that any better? No, that's better. That's better. That uh, so me Star with, Trek movie. <laughs> with the scale at the Osprey site, I believe it was just for uh, uniformity and being able to treat all residents the same. So if we had a scale at each site, uh, then we could bill by weight for each site and that everything would be treated the same uh, instead of having to estimate volumes in the back of a truck. Uh, uh, everybody's eye is a little bit different and it's very hard with different size boxes and trucks and different size trailers to estimate those volumes and weights and try to be consistent across the board. So with the scale at each site, uh, and being able to, to make sure that we're being as consistent as possible, uh, it would help each other, all sites be the same. Uh, without that, and without some fairly major upgrades to the sites, uh, it's hard to do that and to accept those items at all the transfer stations. Uh, just to get back to a couple of the other comments as well. Uh, when transferring uh, from site to site, the number of bins that we have to use to transfer the bulky items is significantly more. It also takes a lot of staff time if the items can't be placed in the bin safely. 
to then bring extra pieces of equipment. So if the stuff's already loaded on a truck, it can take them directly to Markdale. It saves having transportation staff bring out extra equipment to load the stuff. So we have a lot of fuel and time spent there. We have trucks going back and forth, backhoes or loaders. Uh, and then we have that's to get it in the bin and packed so that then another truck can come from Wilton's and take it to the Markdale site to then be sorted and processed there and then landfilled properly. So there's a lot more to it than just having it trucked. Uh, it's when it gets set to the side at the site and then has to be reloaded. It, it ends up into a lot of staff time. So to properly accept these large and bulky items, there would be some significant site improvements have to be made uh, as well as the scale uh, and that I, sort of stuff. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, any follow-up to that, Councillor Nielsen? Okay, uh, there was a question that came from Councillor Allen about 30 trucks versus one truck. I don't know if anybody wanted to wait into that one. Um, the question, I don't know if there's any questions. The question I have uh, to the director or just in general is, um, since this has been in place in 17, it haven't fully, has been fully implemented. My, my question is around the Mennonite community that maybe doesn't have the, the full feasibility of going to the Markdale site with regards to their household garbage. And um, I know I had a quick conversation with uh, Danielle before lunchtime with regards to Highway 10 and how busy that is. I don't know if there's any consideration from that perspective in the sense of um, uh, that community has, you know, the uh, horse and, and cart type system versus of transportation. I just wondered in the sense of Highway 10, do we want to encourage that type of, or do we want to make some options available to our community? I just raise that in the sense of if it's more than just, and I don't know if that's been an issue. I really don't know. I, 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 I was raised to my attention and I just raised that here as for, for conversation. Sean, I don't know if you have any comments that way. Just to jump in there, so household waste will still be accepted there. So anything that can be transferred in a vehicle. So the uh, buggy would be considered a vehicle. So if it can come in in a buggy, uh, we would accept that. It get thrown in the bins. It would be the large bulky items that come in, uh, which I don't know if they transport those on like by horse and wagon to those sites or how that is. But uh, if that's the case, then they would have to have those transported to Markdale as well. Uh, whether that's through a contractor or, or how that gets done, that would be up to those residents. But their curbside would be the same as always. And if it's household bagged waste that it comes in, it can be put in the bins, same as always. Right, okay. Any uh, further Discussion on the motion that's on the floor. Okay, I'll uh, we'll read it again. I think I read it. Yes, I did read it because it came up September 1st. So seeing as no other discussion, all in favor of the motion. Opposed? That motion is, okay, hang on. I should have, I should have. Okay, let me okay, let me go back to this. All in favor of the motion. I just want to make sure I catch the hands. One, two, three, four. Opposed. That motion is carried. Okay. Moving on then to item 7.9, water and wastewater master servicing plan. Um, Sean, I know you're bringing this forward, and your suggestion is to go to Committee of the Whole for a further discussion. Uh, does somebody care to move the motion that's at, at hand? Councillor Nielsen, question. moving? Oh, you have a question for the motion just for clarity. For okay, sure. okay, go ahead for clarity. Sorry, for, well, council members, I didn't turn my mic on. I just asked the mayor for a question of clarity first. Um, our committee, the whole schedule is fairly uh, full and the timeline in which we're going through this. Wondering if this makes more sense to put to a special meeting of council um, just to move up the timeline or through the clerk, if this could be bumped to, uh, I know we have a special committee of the whole meeting coming up next week. If this could be bumped to the top of the list, just for timeline, because this one is time sensitive. Okay, uh, I'll go to Madam Clerk, do you have a comment? Um, some of the items that are on there do have other timelines associated with them. I don't have the list right in front of me at the moment. Um, however, but some are 
say in the fall. So we're getting close to the fall. So there's, I, I don't recall right now what the reasoning is for the fall. It was probably before some kind of event that was going to happen or those kinds of things. Um, and I don't know that I would be in the position to prioritize any item other than based on timelines required. Um, uh, so um, I, I would defer to Director Moyer to let me to let Council know what the timelines associated with this uh, master servicing plan would be. Probably yesterday, but go ahead, Sean. <laughs> Comments, uh, time frame. On the master servicing plan, this one is more for Council's information and just to get it in the queue. Uh, we had committed back, I believe, in February when this came uh, before the next five year plan. So we do have a couple of years, but we the plan was to try and get it in front of this Council uh, so that we can get some direction on where to head so when we get to the next five year plan. We're a little closer. Director Moyer, you're garbled again. So you remind me of you remind me of Luke Skywalker going in on the Star Wars uh, the little plane there, and he kept wiggling his little uh, mic. You saw the movie, right? <laughs> I think we got most of it. I think we got most of what you said there, Councilor Nielsen. Are you looking to move that? Um, so through you, Mr. Mayor, I think that what the, I heard is that we do have some time frame, and that's not a rush like I thought it was. So then I would move the motion as written. Okay, thank you, and thank you, thank you for that, Councilor or uh, Director Moyer. Do I have a seconder, Councilor Alwood? Okay, moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Alwood. That Council receives staff report EV sorry ENV twenty one zero five regarding the water and wastewater master servicing plan, and that Council refer this information to a committee of the whole for further discussion. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor of that? That is carried. Thank you. We go on to grant match funding application. <clears throat> uh, there's a, an opportunity here. Would somebody care to entertain the motion? Deputy Mayor, sorry, I didn't look hard enough to the right. Do I have a seconder? Uh, gee, what is uh, Councilor Valaket with a V. All right, so then moved by Deputy Mayor, second by Councilor Valaket, that Council receives staff report ENV 2106 regarding grant match funding application and that Council directs staff to engage with grant match to submit a funding application to complete a water main improvement capital project at the Markdale Complex Community Center and Arena and the addition of a bulk water station and a seasonal water bottle fill station. Any comments? Seeing that, oh, go ahead, Councilor Allen. And yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just looking at the um, the fees. Uh, I know if we don't get a grant, then um, we don't get a grant. And if we do anything up to a million, they take 10%, which seems fairly hefty, but um, <coughs> if, if we don't use them and we don't know of grants that are available, we don't get it, we've got nothing, but it, it just seems like a, a large chunk of the grant of, of government money to not go towards the intended project. Just wondered if there's any other comments. How was your grant writing, Councillor Allen? Are you pretty good at it? <laughs> <laughs> no comment? <laughs> Uh, comments from staff? I don't know, um, Sean or, or, or staff on that side, any comments with regards to the percentage of uh, fee for writing that application? I know we did this with a water tower. We went down and we tried to get funding for it and we took the risk, but we weren't successful. Sean? Can you hear me? Don't move. Uh, so <laughs> my silver tongue is not near as good as our chief librarian. Uh, so it is usually better for somebody to help with this. I know there are different ranges. I've heard that there's uh, ranges from 10 to 15 percent uh, on some grant writing applications. So we felt that this one with no fees at all, uh, unless we were successful, uh, was kind of the best option. Uh, 
for applying for these and, and they do send us emails quite often on different grants. Uh, but this one, I thought this project's been kind of sitting, I know, uh, the fire chief Rod Leeson and I talked about doing some upgrades in this area many years ago, uh, and it just has never really been pushed to the top of the budget, but I thought it uh, matched this opportunity well and thought it'd be worth submitting for that. Right. And, and like I said, we got nothing to lose and all to gain. In that sense, other than, than the, the cost of the, the cost of providing the service. Okay. Any other um, comments? Let's move. Oh, Deputy Mayor, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Um, the only question I guess I have is uh, perhaps a little operational. Uh, it mentions having a seasonal water uh, bottle fill station. Will this be accessible um, even if the uh, arena is not open? Early days, uh, I don't know, Sean, you have a comment to that? Will it be accessible to the public even if the arena is closed? So our thought with this was yes, uh, with the sports field being there and, and being accessible to walkers and people uh, in the area or when they have their, or if we can get back to having their horse shows and stuff there, that there would be some sort of an opportunity for residents to get water at that site as well. Uh, outside, obviously in the winter time, that's pretty tricky, uh, but uh, our hope, and like the mayor said, this is pretty early in the, the process, but that would be our hope is to have it available for residents. Thank you. Okay. Seeing there's no other questions uh, with regards to moving forward with the grant match funding application, all in favor of this motion. That's carried, okay. Moving on item 7.1, one coach house appeal, burn permit on municipal property. And this is uh, either approve or deny, ask. And I think just for clarity, does everybody understand the, where the property is? I know there were some questions of clarity that was sent around. Okay, so this um, it's pretty straightforward. Councilor Valiquette, are you moving a motion? And sorry, Deputy Mayor, do you have a question? Yes, sir. I was going to actually um, ask uh, Chief Wellwood the implications um, of uh, of this uh, property not having a fire number from a safety perspective. Marty, thank you, Council. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Valiquette. Um we identify them by roll numbers when we um, issue the permits. So we get that quite often with farm properties that they don't have a fire number. So we go by the roll number and we know where that location is just because of its Queen Street uh, proximity. So we don't have an issue with it, putting a permit on there. So just, Councilor Valiquette, do you have a follow-up to that or anything? That was my question answered. I'd like to hear um, other councillors. And just to follow up with that, so basically, if there is a call, um, Chief Wellwood, and there is no 911 number, uh, maybe that's just going back to where Councilor Bellicate is coming from. How do they know that where that property? And you're right, some real properties don't have 911s, okay. uh, so they go by a, an address, is what you're trying to say. Yeah, they quite often would. We issue the burn permit by the rule number, but if there's a, a call, it would more or less be the in the area of. So quite often we would get the area of, you know, for that location be, you know, Main Street and John Street. So we would kind of approximate it down. And if we, going by our app and our uh, burn permit system, we can look for all the permits in that area and we can narrow it down to that to that location more specifically. Okay, thank you for that. Deputy Mayor, I think you were next. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to confirm that the fire chief just said that the, the fire or fire and fire and emergency services doesn't have issues with um, having a burn or uh, providing a burn permit. From the email that has been sent in, um, it seems that there is the indication that a burn permit was declined for for the group. So the the, the subject especially comes across as appealing a decision. So I'm I'm a little um, confused as to whether the municipality had. De denied them a burn permit or if this is an application that is coming before council sorry 
who would like to answer that? Madam Clerk? Uh, thank you. So this request, the burn permit was requested for not property that they own. This was requested on property that is owned by the municipality. So the municipality is um, having to make a decision right now about whether we are going to allow somebody other than, municip than the municipality to um, do controlled burns on our Campfire Burns, Chief Wellwood would be able to answer this better than I could, but um, on that property, because he received the initial request, I just received the email afterwards for the appeal. Deputy Mayor, do you have a follow-up on that clarity then? Yep, so uh, the, the only follow-up I have then is, so my assumption, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we would have told them that they would need to uh, send an email or communicate with council for council to make a decision on this. Would that be correct? Oh, big coming in. I can take ahead, that one uh, <laughs> through you, Mr. Mayor to Deputy Mayor. Our, our normal process is if um, a person applies for a burn permit and they do not own the property, they need to get the permission of the property owner. We have that for you know, farmers or contractors or renters. So in this case, uh, they applied for the permit. Uh, they've had per, uh, burns there before. This time they actually asked for a permit to follow the process. And because they are not the owner of the property, we need they need to get permission from the proper owner, which is the municipality. And we felt as a as a group that I cannot give uh, them permission to use the municipal property because that sets a precedent going forward uh, for other properties throughout the municipality. So we thought it best to bring it to council to let council give us direction for this situation. Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I don't know if the CAO wanted to add to that, but I, I am ready to make a motion if uh, you're willing to entertain that. Oh, sure. I, I do have other questions on the screen, but go ahead if you wish to make a motion. Thank you. Uh, I would move that council approve the CMHA request for the burn permit on the municipal owned property located across from 55 Victoria Street. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Valacat. Okay. Uh, moving on then to other questions. I have uh, Councillor Little and then Councillor Allen. Go ahead, Councillor Little. No, my Madam, question is Sorry, on. just hang on. Does, Madam Seal, you're on the screen. Did you have a comment? Sorry, I see you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Council, um, obviously, I, it's always comes down to risk and liability. Um, with fire, there is risk, and the liability would be on the municipality. Staff didn't feel comfortable making that decision, and that's why it's in front of Council today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarity. And certainly on the side of insurance is something we always have to be careful of for sure. Sorry about that, Councilor Little. I'll, I'll go back to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That kind of changes what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> I had, I did have some questions about um, thinking that this might be denied, but I did have some questions for um, Chief Wellwood. If there had been any issues, um, it sounds like they've been doing this for a number of years. Have there been any issues in the past? And um, would there be any um, mitigation measures or any, any kind of um, guidance that could be given to this group that would um, address any safety issues? Thank you. Uh, Chief Wobbett. Uh Through your counts, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Council Little, um, they've had fires in the past and they've always had it in a small contained area. Uh, they've had a pail of water there, which is what we require under the burn permit. So in the past, we've never had any issues with them. Um, this time they asked to get a permit first and then all of these other questions came up. So we've never had any issues with them having these uh, campfires in the past because they're always supervised. They have extinguishing methods there and they're only for a short term. They've had them just for you know, one or two hours in an afternoon during the day and then they're put out once they leave. So we've never had any issues with them in the past. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was thinking about the, the risk factor also. Um, anytime the public uses municipal property. I'm thinking back to the, the request um, for the road allowance out in Eugenia that we just dealt with, that we're asking them to 
to um, to indemnify the municipality, um, and all they're doing is driving over a, a an existing road allowance to get to their property. This is a, a fire where I'm assuming there's going to be kids around a fire, and I've got um, grandkids that love to throw things in the fire and run around and. Um, would we be asking for the CHC? I'm assuming that's either the CHC or the, the mental health to, to have insurance to cover the municipality's risk. That could almost be a CAO question <clears throat> or, 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 and the fire chief, uh, Adam CEO, do you care to uh, wade into that question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to Council, um, we could certainly request uh, a certificate of insurance naming the municipality as an additional insured. Uh, I would also request if Council is leaning towards approving the application that we have uh, the Coach House contact the fire department to inform them of when they're having a fire so we have a heads up. So just as the permit process, uh, I know from from an agricultural permit, generally before you have a burn, you were supposed to call in. And uh, the funny thing is they know who you, who you are when you call. And uh, they, so basically you are, when you do that process, you, you do make that call. You're supposed to make that call before you have the fire. Um, uh, uh, Chief Wellwood, is that adequate in the sense of, of the call in? Because that is that the process now, now with a, that's with a field uh, permit, but I'm not sure with regards to a bonfire permit, that's usually a yearly thing. Is this, this, is this a, like a $20 yearly thing or is this more like a, explain the purpose and, and how would we follow up with the call in? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the rest of council as well. Um, the, the call in feature is only for agricultural and non-agricultural yeah. burns. So if you're having, which allows you to have a 20 foot by 20 foot by six foot pile for trees and limbs and brush and so on. Campfires, you pay $20 that gets you for the uh, year. And you do not have to call in when you're having for each campfire because you be, could be having a campfire you know, multiple times in a, in a day or so on. So that just becomes, becomes too onerous. Um, so campfires that do not need to call in. So as the CAO mentioned, if the CMHC wants to conduct a fire, they can call us and let us know that it's happening and uh, we can go by and do a quick site inspection and they should be good to proceed. We may, if that's, a, if that's something this council or through the motion is, maybe that's a separate motion or, or amendment to the motion that's on the floor. Uh, Councillor Allen, you raised that part. I'll go back to you uh, for that question because you asked the point about liability and, and uh, do you have any follow-up to that to, from the information that's provided? Um, just that I, I would support it if we were going to be covered by insurance, but if, if not, then I don't think I could support it. Okay, well, maybe I'll come back to you for an amendment. Uh, Councilor Nielsen. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The GIS mapping shows a significant portion of the property is dirt, um, but we all know that the GIS mapping uh, visual is a little outdated. I'm wondering how much of the property is dirt and where are they, if they're having the fire um, located on the area where there's no vegetation around it. Okay, uh, Chief, I guess Chief Wellwood. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Nielsen. Um, currently, I believe the property is being maintained by the neighbor directly to the north of that. They're cutting the grass and you know, keeping it presentable. And I believe they're having the burn that they have is pretty much right in the middle of that lot in the in the in previous years. Hope that answers your Mr. question. Nielsen, do you have a follow-up to that? No. Okay. Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. I just wanted to uh, make sure that the, there was clarity on who is um, uh, going to be doing the burn. It is CMHA. It's not. It's not affiliated with the CHC uh, in in any way. Um, so I just wanted to uh, clarify that. Uh, if if the only thing that is um, 
preventing this from getting uh, support is the requirement for the uh, for the insurance. I'm, I'm more than happy to add that as an amendment to the uh, uh, to the motion. Uh, or if there's I mean, insurance and possibly the calling in or, or having it before the fire by the well, yeah, and, and providing notification. Yes. Okay. So, so I think procedurally, I have to take that as an amendment. So you're making an amendment to the main motion. Do I have a seconder for that, Councillor Allen? Are you looking to second that motion then? Okay, so there's a seconder to that amendment to the motion of uh, adding that they're required to provide insurance. Uh, I guess it's just insurance certificate or some proof of insurance. And secondly, that they need to phone Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Worship. So the amendment would read that the main motion be amended by adding the following clauses. That council direct staff to advise the CMHA that a certificate of insurance naming the municipality as an additional insurer be required prior to burn permit approval and that the CMHA will be required to notify the fire department each time they intend to burn on the property. Okay, so that was moved by Deputy Mayor, second by Councillor Allen. Any discussion on the amending uh, motion? Councillor Alwood. Normally, when we sorry, your worship. Normally, when we uh, require liability insurance like this, uh, we specify the amount. Should that be in the amendment? Uh, well, I'll go to the mover. Uh, Thank you. Mark. Thank you. I believe the CAO can communicate that to the group. Okay. And generally, it's five million, but I don't know if that's going to be the requirement we're going to ask here, Madam CEO, or. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, we evaluate the risk and base the amount on that. So we can do that internally. It's generally a maximum of 5,000, uh, sorry, 5 million. Okay. I think that, does that take care of that question? Councillor Alwood? <clears throat> um, if Madam, sorry, Your Worship, if Madam CEO is uh, um, okay with uh, staff working out what the uh, limit of the liability insurance should be, then it doesn't need to be in the uh, amendment. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion on the amending motion? And that's to include uh, insurance and calling in before the fire. Seeing none, all in favor of that motion. That's carried. Going back to the main motion, which has been amended for approval. Um, any comments with regard? I think it's been read off. So any comments with regards to that main motion? Seeing none, all in favor of that? That is carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on uh, to regards to award of uh, tender of RFT F18 2021-11, one new three quarter ton pickup. I know, uh, uh, fire Chief Wellwood, this is uh, under the fire department. Is there any questions or would somebody care to move this resolution? Councillor Nielsen, Deputy Mayor, any discussion on that? I think that's a pretty darn good price. Deputy Mayor. I, I would like to uh, point out that the uh, absence of the FES liaison was felt at the tender opening. Okay. There you go. It, it, it proved that it was a good price. Yeah. <laughs> All right. For some reason, I'm not able to download these reports. But uh, anyway, um, any other discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Just bear with me just a second. I went to my iPhone, so try that. All right, moving on to 7.13, station two roof replacement. Uh, this is regards to, uh, I think a real good report. Would somebody care to move that report or have this guy? Deputy Mayor, Councilor Neal, oh, Councilor Little, I'll get somebody from the screen. Uh, any discussion on that report? Oh, Councilor Allen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Two things, um, it, we've got the grant. So what happens to the $10,000 that was approved in the budget? And the other, my other question, concern, is the drastic difference in quotes. Um, 
I think the reason we get three quotes is a couple of reasons. We're using the public's money, so we want to make sure we're we're um, getting a, a variety of quotes, but also to make sure we're getting the same um, level of service and quality of product. And I don't see how we can be getting both of those with a quote that is so much lower than the other two. $25,000 for a, I don't know how many square feet that building is, but it's maybe the, the fire chief can, can give me that number, but um, uh, yeah, I can't see how they can do it for that. And will they get partway into the job and then realize that they can't do it and bail out? Okay, that's some, some good questions. And certainly uh, uh, there's a large discrepancy there. So um, Chief Wellwood, do you uh, wish to address that question? Just, sorry, just Mr. Mayor, if I could, just one other point. If you, if, if we, the next item, 7.14, the bids for the, the overhead doors, if you look at those, all three of them are, you know, within probably 10% of each other. So that's, that's where really, that's where quotes should be. And, and this is, I didn't work out the percentage, but it's huge difference. Thank you. Well, it could be that the other quotes are just way too high. <laughs> I won't make any more comment. Uh, Chief Walwood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Allen. Uh, I had those equal uh, concerns. Um, I did check with the company that is proposing the work. Uh, they have done work at the station here in, in Markdale uh, about eight years ago and they completed a roof replacement at the fire hall in Flesherton at the same time. Um, they, became, they came recommended to me by the building department. Uh, they were a local Mennonite company um, and their methods are, um, I guess, economical. I'm not sure how to describe that, but uh, I compared, I confirmed the scope of work and the materials that they are using is comparable to other companies. Uh, I know I did send out quite a few quotation requests and I got back two plus uh, the one from the building department. Um, a lot of the contractors were just simply not interested uh, in doing the project because of, of their schedules. Um, so unless that had some bearing on the pricing, I'm not sure, um, but I, I checked the scope of work and they seem to be comparable. So that's why I've uh, presented the Creeline Enterprises uh, bid. And just last week over the draft of gender review, I think you mentioned they changed their name or something, uh, or Chief Wellwood? Yes, they used to be called Daymar, and then they've changed names to Creelon Enterprises now. Thank you for that. Councillor Allen, do you have a follow-up to that? Um, yeah, hearing those comments, perhaps the other companies are so busy that they just put a ridiculous number on it, and if they get it, they'll fit it in and make a fortune. It's, um, it's just, a, you know, I think we can all agree that to see quotes that different, it does kind of trigger some alarms. Um, but if they've done work for us before, then um, that's great. We're, um, we're looking after the taxpayers' money. Thank you. Right. And, and you asked a question about the 10,000 regards to that was in the budget. I don't know if there's an answer for that or not. Go ahead, Chief Wallwood. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I it'll go into fire reserves uh, that amount and be carried over to the reserve account. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's completely happy about that, but he, he, at least he knows where it went. <laughs> you, you, you saw me shaking my head a wee bit. Uh, I guess the, the same question that's come up before. Uh, the 2021 base budget or budget will be used as the 2022 base budget. And I know it's only $10,000, but here we've got $10,000 in next year's budget that we didn't need or use. Uh, yes, it's going into the reserve. So um, I think if it was a lot more money, I'd push a little harder, but for 10,000, we'll add it to the reserve. 
sure you won't forget about it. <laughs> oh, Madam CEO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was speaking to you as Deputy Treasurer. Um, so the original money wouldn't be coming from the base budget or from the operating. It would have been transferred either from the capital budget or from the reserve. So it'll just stay where it was originally and uh, we'll uh, have it there to use at a future date. Okay, that's, that's, thank you for that clarity, Madam CEO. Deputy Mayor, did you have a follow-up? I, the... I like that answer better. Sorry, yeah. Marty. <laughs> I was just going to ask if uh, it was one of those one-time budget if, um, items that wouldn't get repeated, so wouldn't get to the base budget. Okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion on that motion? That uh, moved by Deputy Mayor, second by Council Little, that Council receive staff report FES 21-04 and that Council support awarding and the, re the replacement of the station to steel roof replacement to Creeline Enterprising Corp in the amount of $25,110, excluding HST. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. I think Councillor Allen that will be on one of our tours when we get back to touring around the municipality. We'll just have to stop and take a look at that, that job when it's there. So, okay. Uh, 7.14. So moving on to 7.14. This is regards to the fire station roll up doors. There's a report there. I don't know if there's any question of clarity. Would somebody care to move that motion? Deputy, uh, sorry, Councilor Nielsen, Deputy Mayor, discussion. Any discussion on that report? I know Councilor Allen's happier with this one because they're closer together. So <laughs> seeing none, all in favor of that motion. Okay, that's carried. Moving on, uh, 7.15, award of uh, microsurfacing. And this is regards to moving on to next year. Deputy Mayor, do you wish to speak to that? Uh, you wish I'll, to move it's that? It's uh, self-explanatory, I'll just move it, thank you. Okay, do I have a seconder? I see nobody in the screen, Councillor Allwood. Try to mix it up a wee bit. Discussion on that, and I think it is pushed, pushed, pushed uh, for next year. I don't know if there's any questions of clarity needed from uh, Council. Uh, seeing none, uh, moved by Deputy Mayor, second by Councillor Allwood, that Council receives staff report TES 2118 and that Council supports awarding RFT F18 2021 10 microsurfacing to Duncor Enterprise Corp in the amount of 252000 sorry, $252,283.33, $252, excluding HST. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Okay. Moving on then to the IITF draft minutes and request. Uh, there's a motion there and a direction. Um, Councilor Nielsen, are you moving that uh, motion? Councilor Nielsen, Deputy Mayor, discussion on that or any? Okay, go ahead, Deputy. Or sorry, go ahead, Councilor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for clarity for my fellow councillors. Um, this particular request is due to the fact that I don't think anybody of the task force themselves are technologically sound enough to complete this task. So we're asking for some staff help on overlapping the GIS mapping uh, from the survey data. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion on this motion? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor. Oh, sorry. I should read it first. Moved by Deputy, sorry, moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Deputy Mayor, that Council received the unapproved IITF minutes, meeting minutes from 2021-08-024 for information and that Council directs staff to compile the GIS mapping from the survey data and overlap that mapping with the municipality's own infrastructure and properties and highlight areas where service levels are lacking. Moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Deputy Mayor, sorry about that. All in favor of that? That is carried. All right. All right, Your Worship, can I request a 10 minute break before we go into? Sure, it's been an hour. So why don't we say we come back at 335? Does that sound close enough? Okay, so we'll adjourn to 335. We're getting longer in our breaks. Everybody must uh, mount their horse and. <laughs>
Okay, we'll uh, call this uh, meeting back to order at 3.37. All right, so we're at the part of our agenda of section eight. And uh, are there any items that uh, the consent agenda that wish to be pulled for um, separate discussions? All of them are planning reports. <clears throat> All right, I don't see anybody wishing to pull uh, any of those items. You can still speak to them, just if you felt that the, the, the direction needed to be different than what's recommended. Seeing there's no nothing to be pulled, so we can have a mover and a seconder for the consent agenda. Councilor Allwood, Deputy Mayor. So that uh, move by Councilor Allwood, second by Deputy Mayor, that the items on the consent agenda be approved with the exception of items extracted for the alternation, alternate consideration, which there are none. None, sorry. So is there any, any general, oh, can't even talk now, any general discussion? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, we have received um, uh, two emails from, from my Mr. Strott regarding PL 21.117. Um, one of the questions on that that he asks is with regards to uh, the enforcement um, of it. Now, I just wanted to confirm because unfortunately my planning knowledge isn't as good as my budgeting knowledge anyways, but um, for enforcement of it, planning or the planning department does have the authority to go and ensure that what is being built conforms to what we're passing here today, correct? Who would like to, I know Michael is off. So I'll just reiterate that question again. So, so, so basically the planning department um, has the authority to uh, enforce um, or to confirm that what is being built conforms with what we're approving through the zoning bylaw, correct? Okay, so I'm gonna, I know uh, uh, Director Benner is on holidays, but uh, Planner Rapke is here. So good afternoon, Planner Rapke. I, I, uh, if you heard the question, are you able to answer the question to Deputy Mayor? There you are. Good afternoon. Hello. Is, is my mic working? So did you, do you understand the question that was asked by the Deputy Mayor or do you wish him to repeat it? I believe he was asking that we have the clarifying, we have the power to uh, check that someone's complying with the zoning bylaw? Yeah, so uh, bylaw and for our bylaw enforcement officer has the power to do that typically. Uh, like we, we don't generally just go onto people's properties, it's complaint based, but yes, if there was a complaint about someone not conforming with their zoning provisions, uh, say they're manufacturing something that, that's not supposed to be manufactured as per the scope of the as of right permissions or whatever site specific permissions are granted through the zoning amendment, then yes, bylaw can go and check. And yes, the zoning bylaw can be enforced to control that. Okay, I'll go, just hang on. I'll go back to Deputy Mayor. Do you have a follow up on that? Uh, no, the only other follow up I have is with regards to the, um, the building size. Uh, that is something that would be enforced through the building permit process. That is correct. Uh, zoning, the zoning bylaw is applicable law under the building code. So a building permit cannot be issued if it does not comply with the zoning bylaw. That is how the size of buildings are, are controlled. So yeah, it has to conform with the 250 square meter requirement. Just to follow up on that, uh, Planner Repke, generally through the C4, it's either a wood shop or a metal shop, correct? As of right, I did in this report here, I believe I put in there, uh, the definition of the two, the, the zone itself, the C4 zone just points to a uh, wood shop, metal workshop as being a permitted use. And then the defined term section then lays out what the scope of each of those is. Um, in this particular one, I, I believe um, furniture and uh, auto parts, I think we're added as an exception there uh, because the as of right permissions only allow agricultural component and the woodworking shop vaguely talks about uh, sawmills and stuff and not necessarily the assembly of stuff into furniture so that is generally what they are the as of right are there and then there's been some clarity added for 
a bit of an expanded scope that of, that is effectively quite similar in nature. Okay, uh, and when the premier is that if that yeah. takes you okay. Um, are there, just hang on the line, just in case uh, there's any other questions with regards to the quarter through planning reports. Or are there any other questions to the consent agenda? Is clarity, Councillor Little. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess it is a planning question uh, with respect to 8.8. <clears throat> when this um, natural burial issue came to council for our um, approval in principle, um, we recognized that the NEC would be the one that would be um, sort of coordinating the, the planning um, direction. And I'm just wondering if um, Planner Rapke is able to tell me who gets circulated, not necessarily agencies, but um, I, I would expect neighboring um, property owners. Um, I don't know what radius, if, if it's the same as uh, the municipality. And also I assume that the town of Blue Mountains, um, they would be circulated as well. Um, just wanting confirmation for the number of people that were interested in this file. Thank you. Thank you for that. Diana Rapke? I am unaware of what the NEC's circulation radius or, or who they circulate to, what their requirements are. I can check. Um, I've been talking with our rep, Nick, today actually quite a bit. So. I, I could potentially get an answer later in the meeting, but uh, probably probably not. But I, I, I don't know offhand. Councillor Little? Uh, yeah, that's that's fine. I, I guess I'm just, um, just following up on the fact that there were, um, while there was support for the idea of natural burial, there were a number of people, especially those adjacent to the um, proposed you know, um, property, and so, uh, yeah, I was just hoping to get some confirmation that um, those individuals would have, um, I guess, this, uh, this information available to them. But uh, if you don't know, that's, that's fine. There's really not anything that we can do about it. Thanks. Just Councillor, just from my experience, generally they, they po are supposed to post a, a placard saying they're uh, requesting for anybody that drives by and then generally it's within a certain distance i know that distance can vary depending on the circumstances of what the development permit is but it's it's i think they do fall quite similarly to the planning act but there is some they, they do i know in certain circumstances they do sometimes go further abroad with their circulation as well depending on the circumstances uh, Councillor Elwood. Thank you, Worship. I was wondering uh, who would actually be submitting the uh, comments from the municipality and whether or not um, sort of in line with what Councillor Little was saying. Although with it in principle, there was a lot of concern and comments made during the public, you know, the public information uh, gathering process. Do those comments get included with the submission to the uh, NEC or is it just, you know, that we approved in principle, period? I'm not sure who can answer that. Good point. Counts, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Rapke, do you have a, a thought? Oh, Madam Clerk, hang on. <laughs> um, based on the nature of this one, and because we have referenced the, the NEC in our response to the initial application that came before uh, Council for this natural burial, uh, we would be submitting um, copies of um, the uh, minutes from our council meeting where we discussed that to the NEC in relation to this so that they are aware of our position on this application. Okay, um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Rapke could say any more. <laughs> Her cares not to. Um, Councillor Alway, did you have a follow up to that? Yeah, so those minutes would include the, uh, the public comments. Uh, there, there were quite a few as I recall. There were a lot of comments if I request. Uh, go ahead, Madam C. Or Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you. So we will supply them with the report and the minutes from the actual meeting where it was discerned. Um, and they will be made aware that there was comments received by the municipality. If they request those from us, then we will, um, of course, send them along. I believe most of them were referenced in the report that came to council. Okay. Any follow up to that, Councillor Elwood? Uh, no, you worship. I believe that's sufficient. Thank you. 
So just, I have a question back, I guess, following up with the deputy mayor with regards to the um, uh, Z27, where is it here? Is it, you made reference to Z20, it's Martin with regards to Chris Strutt, who, who did say, now, did you get a copy of that, those emails, uh, Planner Rapke? It's with regards to PL21117, uh, Martin, and he had sent two emails. At least I got two emails. I'm presuming everybody else. There was like a number of questions. There were about four different questions in that. Did you receive that? Uh, I received two emails this morning. I drafted this report about two weeks ago, though. Yes. No, I understand. And yeah, I'm just looking at, uh, I got it at 11. 13 p.m. last night. I'm not sure when others, maybe maybe it came later for you. It's It, it lists us off about one about uh, dry goods. It talks about uh, two, what tools does the municipality have in place to ensure that these industrial production plants are producing what they are printed? I think Deputy Mayor sort of asked that question. Uh, the other one was, um, there are a lot of hazard lands and wetlands directly down the hill from this proposed industrial production plant, what kind of environmental insurance does this applicant carry in case of contamination? Uh, basically, in closing, it is time the Greyhound steps up and re represents all the, of its constituents. There are a number of number of opposition to this rezoning application and, and council's turn and to do the right thing, blah, blah, blah. So it goes on about, about reasons why, but there was one question in here that I did want to pull out about. They were asking what exactly uh, were they going to be manufacturing? And is that something that, um, is that something that we could press upon in the sense, I know from your being here for two or three years, uh, they are generalizing when we go through the public portion and then it sort of either falls in. And I know we made those changes a number of years where we allowed at one time we would have either be a metal shop or a wood shop, but then we changed it that you could be either or with, I guess you said some exceptions to automobile automotive so is there do you or is that something that is available to to further follow up on in the sense of what exactly will they will be doing or is that something that's they're not quite sure or do you have any comments sir yeah so that is a legitimate concern i i get where that's coming from and a lot of the applications we've been receiving lately have been a bit vague. So I've actually spoken to Solomon. Solomon does a lot of these applications. This one's his own too for this particular one. And yep. clarified, so when you apply for C4 and you don't necessarily know what you're doing yet, you can do that. But permitted uses is only what is defined in the definition of the metalwork shop and the, the woodworking shop as of right. If you're going to go make solar panels or whatever, any, anything else, you're not allowed to do that technically. That would be in violation of the zoning bylaw if you're manufacturing something or doing a thing that's not in the scope of that permitted right. use. So in that conversation, actually based on these concerns from the public meeting, I had that talk with him, which is why we've thrown that exception number in there because he has indicated to me, it's either going to be auto parts manufacturing, which is quite similar to the scope of the agricultural component manufacturing permitted as of right by the zone and uh, uh, wood furniture manufacturing, one of the two. So the uh, exception then has clarified that, that those two things would be in scope there would not be latitude as of right legally to go and make anything else that's outside the scope of those things with the bylaw as it's written now. Okay, thank you for that. Just in your opinion, in the sense it talks about industrial production plants, but these are considered small scale. Is there any definition on how that C4 is, is defined in small scale versus large scale? I guess they're, they're considered small scale. I, I, I'm just going back to, to add some clarity to what's in the email. I don't know if you have any comment there or not. Yeah, so the, the provincial policy statement leaves it, it quite open to municipalities to define what is within the scope of an on-farm diversified use, what you are and aren't going to permit. The county plan then provides context, uh, mostly through a table of very general descriptions of permitted uses manufacturing and is vaguely mentioned in there and then our plan takes it a step further to define things as being small scale in the definition section 
which is where that limit of 250 square meters for the building and 750 square meters for the outdoor storage area comes from. That's straight from our plan where we have defined that. And then uh, the plan also says the on-farm diversified use can only be a small scale uh, thing of that nature. So that, that's how all those pieces kind of fit together. Right, and, and just to follow up on that, the county changed, there's a, and a few other municipalities in the county changed the size, but we stayed at 250, but some of them have gone, there's been a change on that a few years back, right? That's They've gone correct. Larger. There's allows 8,000 square meters for an on-farm diversified use. And I don't remember offhand if there's even bothers defining a, a small scale uh, use at all, or if that's just our plan. I know, I know we, Gray Highlands sort of stayed the course with the 250 versus expanding and, uh, okay. Thank you for that clarity. Okay, uh, so we have it uh, moved and second by Councillor Allwood, second by Deputy Mayor that the consent agenda be approved. Any last further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. A lot of those will be going into the bylaw portion next. So we do have bylaws uh, running from 2021-081 to 2021-086 consecutively. Are there any of those bylaws wish to be pulled separately? Or if not, can I have a motion for all the bylaws? Councillor Valaket, I have a seconder for those bylaws. Deputy Mayor. Any discussion on any of those bylaws? Seeing none, all in favor? And I can be here to sign them tonight. <laughs> That is carried. All right, so moving on to, wow, well, we're moving along here very quickly. Uh, moving on to a few notice motions that are placed on our agenda. Uh, first one is uh, Councilor Nielsen, uh, Flesherton Floating Dock. Notice was previously presented at the 2000, sorry, July 21st meeting. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm presuming, Councillor Nielsen, you're wishing to move this mo uh, notice of motion? Uh, absolutely, Mr. Mayor. So do I have a seconder? Deputy Mayor. Moved by Council Nielsen, second by Deputy Mayor, mm -hmm. that Council direct staff to investigate the cost of putting a floating dock in the Flushington Pond so it can be discussed during the 2022 budget process. Uh, Mr. Nielsen, do you wish to speak to it first? Just to speak to my notice of motion quickly, if I may. Um, just having visited and uh, being at the Flushington Pond uh, lots of times this summer, um, lots of different uh, residents, both young and old, have commented on um, how great it would be if something like this was there. I'd just like to specify to staff that it doesn't necessarily have to be a floating dock in the middle of the pond if it's a dock that comes out from land, so it's accessible right from the land, that's fine too. Uh, I, th I think I should have been more specific or given be maybe less specific in uh, how I worded the notice of motion. So just wanted to give that <laughs> as part of it. So as it works through, if this is carried and moves forward, then working through the budget process will add those clarity. You could have it out in the middle of the pond, you gotta swim to it though. Well, that was my first thought. <laughs> Sorry, that would have been my first thought. Right, uh, I know Deputy Mayor, do you wish to speak to it? Thank you, uh, Your Worship. I did second it to bring it to the floor, and perhaps this is not a conversation for today, and feel free to cut me off if it isn't. Um, the only question I have is, is it worth investigating the cost of adding a, uh, a feature to a, to, a, to a pond that is not open half the season? Um, that's the only question I have. Okay, so half the season, but is it going to be left there? I guess Councilor Nielsen will let you address those. I maybe for clarity, Deputy Mayor, are you talking about because of the pond closures because of the water quality? That is, yeah. So this uh, particular year, the Flushton Pond is actually open for majority of the season so far. I think there's been only uh, a couple of week, a quick couple of weeks where it was tested high. Um, I would also state that the pond has never been closed. Uh, it is a swim advisory and a swim risk. Uh, and then residents are able to make their uh, decision based on themselves or just being a heads up. So um, there has been swimmers even on the times when uh, there is a risk there. Um, it is up to the public just to acknowledge that the risk does exist. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilor Wilson. Deputy Mayor, do you have a follow-up? Uh, no, no further follow-up. Thank you. Any comments? Councilor Allen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, I've just been going through my head about the staff that um, will be in attendance. And I think perhaps maybe um, the, our fire chief and myself might be the only ones that realize or know that the Flesherton Pond used to have a dock that went out, I'm going to say, 15, 20 feet. It also had a raft out in the middle of the pond, and it had a high and a low diving board. So we went and they did swimming lessons in the summer. So quite a drastic decline um, there. Um, safety, insurance, um, backyard pools, I guess, uh, have taken away from the, the use of the pond. But um, as Councillor Nielsen knows, there's quite a few people that do use it. So I think some kind of feature would be excellent. Thank you. Did you learn how to swim there, Councillor Allen? <laughs> no, but um, two of my kids did. Very good. I just thought I'd... Okay, thank you, Councillor Little. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a consideration. Um, I have nothing against this proposal per se, but... I do wonder about process and um, if you look at the next item, we are discussing very limited resources. And so I, I do have some concerns about an item being added to the agenda in isolation um, and think that as we've just um, approved the recreation master plan, which includes various amenities, recreational amenities around the, the municipality, that there would be some uh, justification coming forward from that um, from that um, that plan. Um, and so, I I guess my concern is that maybe we all have wish lists. We all have things that are important. Um, you know, to our particular interests in our particular communities, um, not saying that we are showing, well, it, it's, it's about the municipality as a whole. And I just, I think there's a lack of process here um, where we're not being strategic. And so I would hope that, you know, ideally when we are concerned about expend, expenditures, that we would consider um, initiatives like this in a more strategic way. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I'm gonna go back to the mover of the notice of motion, Councillor Nielsen, to address that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just in response to process, uh, as individual councillors, we cannot give direction to staff. We can't give direction towards the budget. So the process is to come to council, put forward a motion to have it added to the budget for discussion. Notice of motion isn't to say we're going to put a dock in there. The notice of motion is to discuss this during the budget process where we can be strategic with what money we're spending, where, why. One of the other reasons why I've put this notice of motion forward is that there's actually a floating dock currently present at the other swim hole in the municipality at the Eugenia swim spot. So I was trying to go for equity as well. So there's my response to your process comment. Okay, um, Councillor Little, do you have any, any follow up to that? I, I, I think Councillor Wilson for that. Any follow up? Any follow up to that, Councillor Little? Or I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I can go to other questions if you wish. Uh, no, I have no response to that. I, I certainly mean no disrespect, um, and I, I just think that we. I, I understand where you're coming from, Councillor Nielsen. Um, I just think we, we, we could move towards having a very big wish list on our, on our budget process, um, which will then be hard to, to actually prioritize without um, kind of that direction in place already. That's the only point I was making, thanks. Okay, thank you for that comment. Uh, I think Councillor Valaket, I think, did you have your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, <clears throat> through the chair. Um, 
I was really listening to Councillor Little there because I, I think I think it, it's she's a very interesting point. I, I agree with Councillor Nielsen. This is um, we can't direct staff, and I think that I'm I'm a big believer in seeing the big picture. And this is um, uh, through a notice of motion is one way of a council member um, being able uh, to put it out there, so to speak. That said, under the lens of a master recreation plan, I do wonder if in particular, once uh, Councillor Nielsen talked about inequities across our ponds, that this would be something that would be investigated and, 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 um, and because of that, and because of the movement on the master plan, I, I I prefer to have strategic eyes on the big picture looking at it. And, and I guess because of that, I would uh, not be in support of, of this specific, specific motion headed down this specific path. Okay. Uh, the Premier, go ahead. Thank you. I'll, I'll come out in, in, in some support of this motion. Um, I do take the points well that councillors uh, Little and Valaket have made with regards to the uh, recreation plan. At the at the same time, I don't think uh, the recreation plan is going to come back and say you need to get rid of the flesh and pond. Uh, that will remain a constant even following the master recreation plan. Uh, we know we will still have the flesh and pond there as a, as a uh, an area for recreational activities. So I. I that's one of the reasons that I can support this because there is a, a, a fair amount of certainty on the existence of that pond uh, beyond the uh, the recreation master plan uh, study in the report. And uh, that's why I think, and then at, at this point, it is um, trying to get information from staff so that we can have more discussion at the budget meetings. And that's why I can support it. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Um, thank you. I'd like to ask a question um, that I would like to ask that the, the deputy treasurer, CEO Gobin, respond in this manner, um, just in relation to the process, because this isn't a request for including something in the 2021 or 2022 budget. It is for discussion of the 2022 budget. So just providing a little bit of clarity on um, how the budget is going to be presented for 2022 and if there's additional items that don't fall within any fiscally responsible number that is presented to council by staff is or is there opportunity for these additionals to um, be discussed thank you mr mayor through you um, we can certainly investigate the cost of that and present it to council as an item for council consideration Yeah, I think that is the process, though, is it not? I think that's the clarity part, right? Is and Councilor Nielsen, do you have any comment to that? Madam CEO, any clarity? Or add more clarity? Oh, where'd you go? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I clicked the wrong button. Um, so generally, when we present the budget, we present the wish list from uh, staff and based on the current level of service and any service enhancements. And then we would have a separate slide that would have any initiatives that have been um, identified. identified by council. And uh, we could certainly have that as a separate item and then council could have the discussion at that point. Okay. I, I don't, just for clarity, and I, I guess I'm looking for clarity, I guess, is there any other avenue other than, sorry, I noticed a motion to bring forward uh, items to be added to the to the budget. There's no other process other than through a notice of motion. I think that's what Councillor Nielsen is sort of pointing out, is process, and I think the clerk as well. So I think point well taken, but I don't know if there's any other avenue for bringing that idea forward. I don't know if you wish to expand that further, Madam CEO, or not. But thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. I proceed. think this is, I think this is an appropriate avenue. As Councillor Nielsen said, no individual councillor can direct staff. Um, so Councillor Nielsen is looking for support. 
um, so that staff spend the time to, to uh, investigate and research on the cost of that. Um, so I do think this is a, a, an avenue that council has to add items to the budget. Okay. Moving on then, is there any other further uh, discussion on the notice of motion? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, then uh, moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Deputy Mayor, that Council directs staff to investigate the cost of putting a floating dock in the Fletcherton Pond so it can be discussed during the 2022 budget process. All in favor of that motion? Opposed? That motion's carried. All right, moving on. Uh, I'm suggesting probably I will need to step out of the chair for this one. Deputy Mayor, would you wish to take over this uh, notice motion? Uh, we have a notice of motion from Mayor McKean providing additional direction for staff related to the budget process. And the notice was previously presented at July 21st, 2021. Mr. Council. Deputy Mayor, your microphone's on. Sorry. Uh, we have a notice of motion from Mayor McQueen uh, that gives additional direction to staff uh, related to the budget process and the notice for this motion was previously presented at a July 21st, 2021 council meeting. Uh, Mayor McQueen, are you moving the motion? Yes, I will. Thank you. Do I have someone seconding it? Councillor Allwood. Uh, Mayor McQueen, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And uh, uh, yeah, just as, a, as the notice of motion reads, it was sort of following up from the report in July and, and uh, I think staff were sort of searching for some direction and, and just wanted to be clear, the very last line is, it says no more than 2% of the overall local levy. I know last year we ended up at 1.5. This is an increase from that from last year, but I mean, it, there's, there's no saying that the budget can't come in higher. There's a lot of avenues of, of making up that. It could come in at seven or 8% in the sense, but it could come back in the sense of, there's so much coming from gas tax, so much coming from reserves, so much coming from levy. Also the opportunity, and I think it's a very good uh, display today is uh, Chief Wellwood, how he was successful with that grant and, and other grants out there were applying for and having somebody else apply for grants. I think there's a lot of opportunities. We're starting early and there's a lot of ways to uh, think outside that box. So yeah, this is, again, this is the, you know, at the very bottom line is a 2% of the overall local levy and not talking about a blended rate or anything like that. This is just throwing it out to give some discussion points uh, at this early time of our 2022 budget. And I'll leave it at that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Councillor Allwood, as a seconder, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I, I'd just like to add perhaps to the mayor's, you know, the, uh, the local levy is only one of the... Uh, Things that are considered when staff is putting together a fiscally responsible budget. Uh, so you have debenture, you have reserve funds, you have grant applications. So uh, staff did look for some guidance, and I believe this notice of motion uh, gives them that guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allwood. Uh, do I have any further questions or comments to the motion? Councillor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So in July, when staff came forward with their report requesting guidance, um, I was pretty clear on making the point that that was the time. Um, I, I asked Madam CAO for her opinion and staff were working on and have been working on the budget already um, and that it would come forward. Um, I was concerned that this was what was gonna happen because now we're two months further down the line and then we're giving direction now for staff. Um, and, I, and I argued two months ago that if we had a number in mind, we should make that number known, we should be specific. I was very specific with my number at 10% as a starting point and that council does its job after that. Uh, I have no problem stating that opinion, um, but here we are two months later and I think it's, um, Unfortunate that this didn't happen two months ago when the topic came up, and I think that it shouldn't be discussed now that the uh, guidance was given to staff to present a fiscally responsible budget, and that council should take it from there. Thank you, Councillor Nielsen. Councillor Velika. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor and Chair. Um, 
I, uh, I agree with Councillor Nielsen. I feel like we have asked uh, staff to do, uh, to do one thing. We've waited a few weeks to allow them to go down that path. And now we are um, essentially pulling the rug out from under them. Um, and, and I would also argue that I am not um, convinced that this uh, provides any direction to staff um, other, other than a number. I, I, I stress, as I did the last time we discussed this, that um, I want to know what the wants and needs end to end are of this community. And I believe that it's council's job to determine how, what makes the priority list and, and how we pay for them. And I think by, you know, I think that council in the past has provided us with their wants and needs in a very open-ended way of paying things, which this council has very successfully used to decrease the levy. And I think that's the playbook that we should follow again. And um, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Valicat. Councillor Little. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I concur with the, uh, my colleagues who spoke just immediately before I am. And, uh, but just to add to that, I think it does a disservice to our constituents to come forward with an artificial um, random number. Um, I think it's important that um, our ratepayers know the cost of services and maintaining operations and the difficulty, I guess, in trying to balance setting a budget for the year um, and being able to continue with a certain level of service and proceed with our strategic priorities. And it's council's responsibility, not staff's responsibility to, to make those hard decisions Last year, um, when the number came out 14% plus, it was alarming, but you know, I think we can't sugarcoat, we can't, we can't protect our, our ratepayers from understanding the, the costs of things and to move the municipality forward. Um, I just don't, I'm not in favor of setting a number like this, particularly 2%. But any number, I think um, staff is aware of the, the, the hard, uh, the difficulties, I guess, that it was in trying to um, deal with public anger over that 14%. And so, uh, you know, maybe it won't be that this time, but I, I think we need to be honest with our ratepayers and say that this is, this is the cost of doing the things that you want um, your municipality to do. And, um, you know, you either raise, raise taxes or cut services, but um, there, are, there are people obviously that, that criticize the budget and want the lowest number possible, but there are a lot of other people who, who consider that paying taxes is a civic duty. And, um, it's investing in our municipality to pay taxes. Uh, so I, I think we can't forget that um, there are more than those uh, vocally opposing the budget every year and wanting the lowest number possible. And like I started out to say, I think it's a disservice to our constituents to, um, to, to make this uh, arbitrary. Let's know, the, let's know the, the real cost and then council will have the decisions to make. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Little. Uh, any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, I will go to the mayor for any closing comments. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I know a lot of years being on conservation authorities and, and past council, sometimes they do set that direction of overall. I mean, this is not saying that it can't come in at 10% and we work it down. And, and there's also the... Um, 
the growth. I mean, we, we got to take that into consideration that we have seen in, in the past year or two that, that should help offset some of those increased costs. But, you know, on the other side is we know that people have been faced with the higher costs, a lot of, in a different, lot of different sectors. Um, you know, the cost of living is, 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 is sneaking up. And, and uh, if you don't keep things at a certain level, then your costs, your, your, your cost of living gets at a spiral out of control. And we've seen that. And they were just saying this morning on the business uh, report that we've had a bit more of a sluggish summer in our economy than the economists were talking about. So things are a little slow and I don't like talking about that because uh, I'm, I'm, well, and part of that, and part of that sector is the restaurant business, the service business, and they're struggling. And uh, so it's just, I just did, it's just a part of being, I think, fiscally responsible too, in the sense of our, our duty. Uh, also that there's also a lot of opportunities with regards to right now. And I know not everybody looks at this, we've been doing this for a while is this, this past year, our last adventure was just over 1.01% for 10 year money. The opportunity is is there for doing those capital projects that allows us to do that, and and so anyway, it's it's I feel it's something that gives a bit of a direction, and it's I threw it out there, and um, you know again this is two percent of the overall local levy we settled last year at one point five, so it's an increase from that, and uh, certainly it's it's to give direction, and uh, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McLean. Um, seeing no further comments or questions, I will read the motion, which has been moved by Mayor McQueen and seconded by Councillor Allwood. Uh, whereas on July 21, 2021, Report FIN 2106 regarding proposed budget guideline schedule came forward to Council and was endorsed. And whereas discussion was held around fiscal direction, but no decision was made. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Council sets the overall budget direction to staff at no more than a 2% overall local levy increase. Uh, those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Okay, those opposed? That motion is lost. Uh, Mayor McQueen, are you uh, asking that I be in chair for all the notices of motion? Probably best, unless okay. you feel that you don't want to be part of that Ch uh, chair, but that, yeah, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 10.3, we have another notice of motion from Mayor McQueen regarding Grey Gables. Uh, notice for this motion was provided in time with the current agenda. Uh, Mayor McQueen, I will assume you're moving it? Yes. Thank you. Uh, do I have a seconder for the notice of motion? Do I have? Councillor Allen has seconded. Mayor McQueen, you have the floor, sir. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, so as the motion is there for us to consider, this is, I felt this is important for this council to support the position uh, of the municipality of Grey Highlands with regards to the 128 bid redevelopment for Grey Gables. Uh, there was a discussion last week at our committee, the whole has to be ratified at our council meeting on the 9th of, uh, of September. So my thoughts are is to have this uh, hopefully endorsed by this council and to certainly be circulated at, uh, uh, I, I would request a, a, a quick service of sending it out tomorrow to other municipalities if that's possible, if this passes, but certainly circulating other municipalities for their councils to, to, to consider and showing that support to the uh, county. I feel that um, the unfortunate thing when we are right now in Zoom and, and that is it's hard to have um, public participation or, or, or getting that feedback from other sectors uh, through the processes that we have. So I felt this was sort of prudent that we need to uh, have support from this council sending it up there to suggest that uh, we support it and other municipalities are, are, so, are, are also continuing to support the redevelopment of, of, uh, of Great Gables. So I'll leave it at that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Councillor Allen, as a seconder, do you have any comments? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, or Deputy Mayor. Um, yes, I was disappointed in the um, decision of the County Council. Um, Gray Highlands worked very hard along with other um, municipalities in the county to not only save Gray Gables, but to be able to get more beds. 
And to say that they don't want to do it at this point because of the financial burden on future generations, I take offense to. Um, that's what future generations do is look after the generations that came before them. If we ignored our seniors, um, then shame on us. <laughs> um, to say that the cost is has increased from 280,000 to 400,000, um, maybe it has. But I bought a house in Flesherton in 2003 for $130,000. I still own it, and I could probably get five, six, seven hundred thousand for it. Prices go up, cost more to build a house now. Um, it's never going to get cheaper. So that four hundred thousand they're saying now in five years or six years or ten years is going to be six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars. It's it's never going to be easy to build a it, to build anything, but the longer you leave it, the harder it's going to get. So something that's going to be debentured over 25 years at a very low interest rate, those are not guaranteed. The number of, or the, the allocation of beds, they could be taken away. And if I really think about it, previous Gray County Council voted to get rid of Gray Gables. It was the new council that decided to um, save Gray Gables and redevelop or add to it. Oh, I am just lost my uh, train of thought too. Um, oh yes, so, so, and now there's a notice of motion that's been discussed and, and, and agreed upon to put it on hold. I, I believe that this hold will, in a year or two, lead to, well, maybe we shouldn't go ahead with it, and maybe that will lead to, well, let's sell it and let the private sector fund it and let them worry about our seniors. And we've all seen what's happened during COVID with the privately owned uh, nursing homes. They're the ones that got hit and got hit hard and a lot of seniors died um, that I think could have been prevented if they'd been in, um, in publicly run facilities. So I think this is just a stepping stone to, to, um, to getting rid of or um, yeah, selling off Gray Gables. Um, as the mayor mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, the senior advisory committee had a, a special meeting and it's probably closed. I will read the motion um, that the senior advisory committee strongly supports the Gray Gables expansion and requests that county council, or sorry, requests that council reiterates its support to the County of Gray for the Gray Gables expansion to continue as previously promised. So, um, yes, thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Any further questions or comments to the motion? Okay, seeing up, uh, Councillor Allwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I share Councillor Allen's concern that, you know, this could easily be the thin edge of the wedge. I can't believe that the, the work that this council uh, and the new, um, and uh, at the county uh, and our constituents did and, and neighboring municipalities did to save Gray Gables. And, and that we're, again, we're talking about it. Um, it it's uh, somewhat shocking to me. Um, I, I would hope that we can get unanimous support from this group to uh, this notice of motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allwood. Um, any further questions or comments? 
Seeing none, Mayor McQueen, I'll go to you for closing comments. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, a few things, I guess, to, to wrap up on this little motion. Certainly, this municipality has invested a lot in in the fight to save Gray Gables, and it took an election to to make that happen, to change the direction at the county of Gray. I'm thinking back to about. Um, as time goes on, you can't get your dates completely right anymore, but there was a huge public meeting that happened at the uh, complex here in Markdale. It was a big outcry of people with regards to wanting to, to save Grey Gables. And I've never seen a public venue have so many people about a certain item. And that was the upstairs and the downstairs. It was, it was, I'm trying to think it must've been 2017, but it was so packed that they, they, the the uh, space for the complex was was over the limit, and then people that came later had to be downstairs in the lobby of the arena. And I think at one time the estimates were over 300 people attended that meeting. And the question was asked at that time was, "Does anybody in this room support the closure of Gray Gables?" And not one person put their hand up. I thought that at that time would have been strong evidence to the county that this community was very much behind. Gray Gables moving forward. Certainly in, in November, or sorry, uh, Jan January of 2019, November or January 26, where I brought forward the notion, the motion to reconsider that, certainly the motion had lots of debate and the motion um, was supported to, to keep Gray Gables from being uh, disposed of and, and move forward. And then that second to that meeting, I, I moved a notice of motion that we would apply for additional beds. So they were, they were somewhat considered and it came back to the uh, Committee of Management, which is the Long-Term Care Committee. And then they brought recommendations and it came forward to County Council uh, about November of um, 2020, sorry, 2019. And I remember delivering the application to Bill Walker's office for the application to expand those long-term care beds. Certainly moving ahead to November of 2020, while well, I was warden through uh, an embargo, but the, it did come forward in the sense that the announcement came that the, the province did grant those beds uh, to be expanded or to be, I guess it was actually in an application for our new build for Gray Gables. Moving forward then, there was a new committee struck from December to then uh, chosen in January of 2021 earlier this year that there, there would be a, a committee management of, of redevelopment of both Rockwood and, and uh, Gray Gables. It moved forward to hiring um, a company that would do a bit of a feasibility study, both for the Rockwood area and Gray, Gray Gables uh, sites. They've moved forward with the feasibility study for Rockwood. They were in the process of doing that feasibility study to come back for, for uh, Gray Gables here itself. Certainly moving forward, they hired a consultant, Colliers, uh, through a tender process. There were seven people that applied. Uh, certainly they uh, were hired and, and are moving through that process. And it was the, the company that suggested that the cost was uh, higher than expected. But part of the feasibility study that got cut short was if you're building a brand new building, the, the feasibility of this building, Gray Gables itself, what's the future of that? Is it, is it, uh, does it have a cash value? or the bigger part of was the whole idea of moving toward a um, community hub or a health campus was the idea and the repurposing of this uh, Gray Gables here today uh, above us would be either for senior or assisted living. And as we know that part of that business has become and will become more profitable. And the part of the equation that they, they stopped short of, of having that feasibility study is to show what that math would look like in the sense of what's the revenue generation from this building that would be offsetting the cost of moving forward for the next 25 years. So there's a lot of parts that we're missing. I reached out to uh, Graham Construction and Own Sound and, and certainly they, my conversation with him was they're doing the uh, uh, Southbridge pro project right now of 160 beds. They were coming in at 175,000. I asked a question if you were doing it today, he said probably 15 or 20 percent, you know, they're about 200,000 per bed. I guess the thought was, and, and I will raise this at the county council next on September 9th is, 
could we move forward of getting a costing of a tendering? I mean, if we go to a, a to the real tendering, get to that level of tendering, and then we will know the number if you go out to tender. And sometimes that is a true telling tale. I know from representatives of the hospital foundation, and when they tendered out for the new hospital, it actually came in a lot less than they expected expected on the cost of uh, of the hospital itself. And I think it came in around seven hundred fifty dollars a square foot they were thinking it's going to be around a thousand dollars a square foot but uh anyway that it it's sort of uh, it times are settling down with the COVID and things are getting back we we understand that and so i guess just just in summary mr deputy mayor i think it's an opportunity for us to give support hopefully that this council will do that and i think it's the right thing to do and again um two other points um 30% of our population right now is between 56 and 75. Push that forward in the next 20 years. Uh, there's going to be a huge demand for long-term care. And uh, certainly with that demand, as people have to go somewhere, and we're at a shortage right now, as if the industry is seeing. And so it's an opportunity to invest and invest in our future and also at the cost of borrowing us today we'll never see an opportunity again i in my opinion of, of of doing it now and i think as to what Councillor allen is saying it's a simple factor of inflation and compound interest in the sense that as time goes on the cost is going to be greater and greater and i did ask that question of cost and inflationary rate uh, year after year was suggested it was going to be five percent um, even higher than what we're seeing that the cost of living could be. So it's going to be a harder and harder to come back to this, uh, this point. So i leave it at that deputy mayor. That's my comments for this notice of motion. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mayor McQueen. Councillor Little. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, question to Mayor McQueen. Um, is there no consideration given to the more intangible item. Uh, well, you did mention the health. Sorry, I don't think that's me. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, what sort of consideration can be given to the idea of the health campus when we've got a brand new hospital, um, the long-term care, the CHC, um, I'm probably missing something, but, you know, there's an opportunity here for a center of excellence in this part of the county. When you, you know, the sum is more, more, or the total is more than the sum of its parts. When you put all those pieces together, it encourages and attracts um, experts and um, best practices and collegiality and accessibility and all these things that, um, are intangibles until you put, put those facilities together. And so I think, um, uh, I guess my question to you, Mr. Mayor is, is that ever a, a discussion or is it just about the dollars and cents? Because there is an intangible value here from creating a center of excellence in my opinion. Thank you. Mayor McQueen. Well, thank you, Councillor Little. And you do ask uh, an excellent question and certainly, um, we have had a presentation from, so the committee of management last year, which I was on as being warden, that committee um, had a presentation from Simcoe County who really prides themselves sort of on that health campus idea. And examples are, I think it's Georgia Villa, I think it's in Penetanguagene or Midland. And um, the, I don't know if, I'm gonna say it's going back almost to two terms where at Amel there was um, a speaker or speakers at, at um, Amel and, and they were from um, Simcoe County and they talked about that type of, of, of uh, health campus idea. And just in a sense from Simcoe County's perspective, they have senior living, they have a lot of different type of, of, of uh, apartments, senior living, assisted living, long-term care in the same location. And you just sort of, they, they stay in the same place. They, they, they age in place in the sense of, you know, as they move through that progress uh, process, I should say of, of aging, um, you know, it, it, it's a continuity of that. And, and certainly uh, the big part of the Simcoe County model is their assisted and assisted living and senior living 
helps offset the cost of long-term care just from the revenue side that helps. So their cost per bed of long-term care is much less than other counties in the province just because of that modeling. And you know what, it goes back to the part of, of a lot of different aspects of, of service that provides or the or what who provides services for seniors and, and all different there they can be also located in that senior um or in that um community hub or that's you know so that you have supporting i don't want to call it businesses but supporting services that that can can uh, you know to different senior uh health issues similar like you know we have here with the chc which is we're very fortunate to, to have that and certainly you know with the new hospital chc greg gables uh, new build and the and, and the uh, current building. I mean, they, that's the whole idea, the whole modeling that they're looking for Rockwood Terrace as well. Uh, that came through the feasibility study uh, from SCH, SC, SHS, I think it was, consultants that talk about that same idea. They want to develop Rockwood in that same that same process, and it's 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 that new model. Yeah, and you, you know, and we we've been hearing about that as 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 more and more as time comes on comes comes goes forward so yes I, I i certainly echo your comments on that sense and that that is happening thank you mayor mcqueen councillor allwood thank you mr chair just a point of order can i can i call a recorded vote on this notice of motion uh yes you may i'd like a recorded vote uh mr chair thank you okay are you also calling the question or are you just asking for a recorded vote when it happens if there's no further discussion, I'd be happy to call the question. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments to the uh, motion? Okay, seeing none, uh, there is a motion on the floor moved by Mayor McQueen, seconded by Councillor Allen. Whereas Great Gables is a 66 bed class A facility by the Ministry of Long-Term Care. And whereas the County of Grey applied and received for redevelopment for Grey Gables, uh, for an additional 62 bed allocation and is considering a new build of 128 bed facility. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the municipality of Grey Highlands fully supports the 128 bed redevelopment of Grey Gables and that council directs staff to circulate this resolution to all municipalities in Grey County for support and request that all resulting resolutions be forwarded to the county of Grey. A uh, requested vote was recorded. Uh, a recorded vote was requested by Councillor Alwood. Uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Desai. Since you've already read the uh, recommendation, I won't do that again. Uh, we will start the voting off with um, Councillor Alwood. In favor? Uh, Councillor Allen. In favor. Nope. Yeah, I thought Sorry. you were, but anyways, I'll go next. In favor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Little. In favor. Uh, Mayor McQueen. In favor. Councillor Nielsen. In favor. Councillor Valaket. In favor. Chair Desai. Opposed. By a vote of six to one, that motion has been carried. Thank you, uh, Clerk Martel. Uh, item 10.4 is a notice for motion from Mayor McQueen regarding natural gas expansion. Uh, notice, for, notice for this motion was provided in timing with the current agenda. Uh, Mayor McQueen, I'll assume you will move that. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Allen. Thank you. Mayor McQueen, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, this starts, goes back a few years with Enbridge and, and um, I don't know if you remember the, the, the council that came from Sogging Shores. I'm trying to think if his name was part of Enbridge. Anyway, um, do you remember his name? Matt yeah, Matt. And uh, anyway, um, I remember having a meeting with uh, Enbridge down in Toronto or being invited to a meeting to talk about um, expansion at the time. And this is maybe going back to 2015, 2016. And I remember drawing out a map of, of, of Grey Highlands. And at that time, there was interest around Lake Eugenia, down toward the Kimberley Valley, uh, extending out Highway 4 many years back, never. Heard. And then more recently, the provincial government had announced, um, I think it was even the, the previous uh, 
the provincial government announced uh, natural gas expansion. And, and then the current government also continued with that natural gas expansion. And there was, I'm trying to think of an area out toward um, uh, Aaron Eldersley and, and around that area were, were quite successful. Uh, and it was ironic that a company from out West was the one that, that uh, continued on to the point of, of expanding and, and, and certainly it's pr processing or, or moving forward today with natural gas expansion. And so, so from that, if you read in the notice of motion, um, myself, the deputy mayor, the CAO, and ended up having a meeting with uh, Mr. Bill Walker about the process and, and, and sorry, a business person here in Great Highlands about where is that process in the sense of natural gas expansion. And so our meeting with Bill, Bill Walker, I'm going to say a month ago before AMO, was that that program has now been um, um, used up and it's the i guess if uh, if there's a new announcement comes forward but then there will be new money but that has been sort of um um applied for and, and distributed i think he also indicated that there was more applications than the, what the money was available for following from that um one may ask well why do we need natural gas and we talk about climate change and and that question but there's a lot of people that um, have and this is you know a lot of areas of gray highlands that uh, was felt that you know those people on oil oil firing furnaces that are on propane certain areas of I mean our I guess our Mennonite community have a like I think a lot of the propane they they were uh, I think diesel generation but they use a lot of generation now through through propane which is a higher cost and I, I from my understand natural gas is a much better gas than, than propane in the sense of of usage and and, and um, efficiency nothing to take away from propane because propane does provide, <clears throat> and we have a, a propane provider in our municipality that provides a lot of service throughout the municipality as well. And this is not to take away from the idea of propane, but it's in the sense of, of efficiencies in the sense of providing better access to um, home heating. And I didn't realize that, um, again, the large part of the Mennonite community does consume a lot of uh, propane and the simple fact is is they not only do they use it for heating of their homes but they use it for generation a lot of their generators now are being converted from diesel generation to or some of them have been converted from diesel generation to propane generation and so they power their their whole shops and, and that so there is so the question that first came about well what is there is there a volume that is even worth considering and it seems to me that there 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 is and um, yeah there are areas that um, you know, that are in our municipality. I think um, between Enbridge and Union Gas, which are now the same company, it seems to be a concern that with it, with conversations with those companies about expansion, yeah, but it seems to be, it, it's taken a third company from out west that's caused, I guess, competition and created some actually expansion here in the province of Ontario. But there is a process, as Bill Walker pointed out, that you need to go through the local Enbridge Union Gas process to see if they're interested of expanding, and if they're not, then it can be opened up to uh, other other uh, um, providers for for natural gas. So I guess the idea here is is it's just looking at the possibility of what are the possibilities. Is there is there is there a, um, a, a flavor? Maybe that's the wrong word. Is there is there a feeling out there in our in our Great Highlands that there would be a demand or or a need for expansion of natural gas? Certainly, um, you know, it's sort of like talking about uh, fiber and internet, you know, you talk about that as well. And hey, you know what, maybe there's an opportunity to do both at the same time, who knows, right? And in, in the sense of, of, uh, of uh, ex, you know, expanding or extolling those uh, national gas pipelines. But this is, this is before that being said, this is just to look at the opportunity and the idea and to get public feedback to see if, if this is something that, that we are even interested in doing. And so that's why I, I've put the forward this notice of motion and the idea of a, nat, a, a sort of a natural gas expansion task force of three councillors. The task force is to go out there, do the job, find out the information, bring it back to council, and then council makes that decision. And uh, so that's why it's not a committee of council that's gonna drag on forever. It's just sort of something that, you know, it's been something that's been hanging out there. And uh, so this is putting that notice of motion out there for us to move forward with that idea as a council. So thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Uh, Councillor Allen, as a seconder, do you have any further comments? 
Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I believe, Mr. Mayor, that um, that meeting that you had was more likely about 2012 or 13. I remember that. I think you wrote and kind of drew it out on the back of a napkin or something. Um, anyways, um, I, I think this is a wonderful idea. Um, uh, before COVID, I think the, the last AMO meeting uh, or conference that we had when I was in Toronto, I talked to Enbridge about the possibility of expansion um, out my way. Um, before I even got home, I got a call on my cell phone and they were quite interested and they gave a kind of the back of the napkin price based on how many users. And, you know, probably if I had gone ahead and done that then, it, it probably would have paid for itself by now, but, um, and also north of Flesherton, don't know if people noticed that um, work done in the spring of this year, uh, two farms that uh, host uh, C4s um, had the natural gas extended to their properties at, I would think, fairly uh, high cost. So it is, in the long run, definitely worth um, expanding and uh, converting to natural gas. So I, I fully support this. The, I guess the, the big problem is Grey Highlands is, is so big and everybody would want it, but it's obviously got to be in high, um, highly populated areas to justify. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Councillor Valiquet, I have you down next. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and Chair. Um, so I cannot um, support this at all. Um, and uh, under the lens of the climate uh, change and, and, and what we have been experienced this summer, uh, 2013 was a long time ago. Natural gas, it's a misnomer that natural gas is clean. Natural gas is not a clean gas. It is a fracked gas. If we are serious about a climate emergency, we need to be moving towards non-polluting renewable sources of energy. Hydraulic fracking, fracking is not the answer. So fracking is the way we are extracting natural gas, which is mostly methane from shale rock formations that are often deep underground. It involves pumping huge amounts of water, chemicals, and sand under a high, high pressure to fracture the shale, hence the name, and it releases the gases that are trapped underneath. This is done because we're running out of a resource called oil. And now the oil and gas people would like you to burn natural gas. Affecting the climate crisis cannot be done by building more pipelines. And I know this is something that isn't uh, popular with some of the, um, I don't wanna say conventional agriculture uh, people because sometimes coming out of a green girl's mouth, that sounds like a bad word. But there are organizations that are pushing for this and I ask you to ask yourself why they are. But if you look at the other ag agriculture um, uh, let's call them lobby groups that you get to look at, one being the NFU, the National Farmers Union. They are against um, continuing to expand natural gas. I'm sorry, it's not the answer. It needs to stay in the ground. Fracked gas contaminates our water supplies and it also creates activities within the ground that are that potentially make it dangerous and causing uh, uh, seismic um, activities. Uh, you can tell that I'm getting very emotional about this. I think that this is a great opportunity for Grey Highlands to put its money where its mouth is and uh, take the climate crisis seriously and do something at the municipal level for what is only going to become more and more of a threat over the next years and decades. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Veliquet. Any further questions or comments? 
Chancellor Alvar. Thank you. Um, natural gas expansion in Grey Highlands is something that I was approached uh, many times during my campaign. And, uh, you know, I remember talking to the, uh, the group out at Lake Eugenia that, that met at the United Church. And uh, that was probably one of the top, top questions. When, when can we get natural gas? I mean, the majority of our rural communities, um, if they're not on natural gas, are heating their home with propane or burning wood. I mean, uh, and if they're not, they're, uh, they're paying the highest prices in the country for electricity to, to heat their homes. So there, there has to be some balance. You know, I, I agree that, that uh, we, we've already recognized there's a climate crisis. We don't frack gas in, uh, in Ontario, to the best of my knowledge. There's, no, there's an abundance of supply from our neighbors to the south who will continue to frack gas, I would assume, and, and, and out west. But I remember at the, uh, the last Roma convention that we were able to attend in person, I attended uh, one of the sessions where they talked about natural gas expansion and uh, lowering the cost of energy. And, uh, you know, somewhere there's, there's got to be a consideration. How do we pay for all this? And uh, I, I, I would be willing to support this task force. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allwood. Councillor Valiquet, I did see your finger go up. Yeah, th thank you, sir. I, I just would quickly like to address Councillor Allwood and, and Councillor McQueen, uh, uh, sorry, Mayor McQueen uh, touched on this as well. This idea, because there are worse alternatives out there, we should give them a less worse one, um, doesn't uh, resonate with me. This is often something that we say of countries that are don't have the financial resources, oh, well, we'll give them this, it isn't as bad. Instead of saying, doing the right step and moving towards what the right source of energy is, which despite reports that are at least five years old, renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy and it's just going to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and it's really too bad that all of us on all of us Ontario winds have a big right welt on our a big red welt on our arm from getting bit by a certain government but the reality of the situation is is it doesn't take a lot of people from a manpower perspective for solar wind and all these types of renewables so I'll, I'll just leave it there thank you Councillor Valiquet uh, any further questions or comments? Councillor Little. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I totally endorse what Councillor Valaquette is saying. She's done a lot more research than I have, but um, there are a lot of things that we currently do and it's hard to stop doing those things, but we're in a position here where I don't think we should be initiating or going down that road of um, of, of uh, fossil fossil fuels and um, yeah, the whole fracking issue. Um, maybe we don't do it in Ontario, but it's getting done somewhere and it's not good for the environment or the people that live in that environment. So um, yeah, I, uh, I support Councillor Valakat's position. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Little. Uh, any last questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, Mayor McQueen, sorry, Councillor Valakat. I would like to ask for a recorded vote. Okay, uh, Mayor McQueen, closing comments. Well, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And, and I certainly appreciate the comments that have been said here with regards to expansion and natural gas. I guess the point is, is we live in a country that, I don't know, sometimes we have to heat our homes six months of the year. Is the alternates, you know, sometimes the less, alternate is maybe the best solution in the sense of the least in, least affecting our environment is sometimes maybe the best solution until we move on to that next part. I will say that part of this and part of the discussion that came out of Mr. Walker's conversation was you need to have a position from the municipality, whether you want to expand or not, if there are funds in the future that come about to, to have that expansion. I know the cost, it's, it's very cost prohibited for us to take it on ourselves, but Certainly, 
Uh, I guess I asked this question today is we look at our urban setting settings that do, do have propane or sorry, natural gas uh, uh, availability, all these new homes that are being built here today. And, and uh, certainly in Markdale and, and surrounding area is uh, all going to be hooked up to natural gas. Uh, I, I don't say it would be one that would be not hooked up and left to be burning oil or wood. I, I don't, I just can't see that. So, I mean, it is moving on with that type of uh, infrastructure that is heating our homes for, I think, the very, uh, you know, for, for a long time to come until there's a, a solution that's out there. And I, I'm supporting, I, I'm not against uh, renewables in that sense of, of, of that, but you know, it's, it's the opportunity and it was, it was brought to our attention and I thought I would bring it here for, um, the opportunity to have a task force to investigate it further and to look at those all those points and uh, as councillor allwood has said it's, it is something that has been brought to my attention by a number of people that are in our municipality would like to see that expand just in the sense of agricultural side um there was i think the fall of 2019 we had a very wet it was a, a very wet fall where a lot of corn and uh um food products were being dried by uh, well, if they had the ability of natural gas, I think the cost was like prohibit. It was cost effective of four times of propane. So a lot of propane was used that fall, and I think there came to be a time where propane became a very much a short in short supply because of the demand. And we've seen that over uh, over the years of certain um, yes fossil fuels that we do use, and but you you certainly see it when it becomes in short supply. Um, people start talking to the governments and saying what's going on and we want, you know, we need energy. And um, again, it's, I don't say we live in the best, you know, the best spot and in, in, in where we are right now, but there's going to be a chat to be a transition and how long that transition is going to be. I have, I, I don't know that crystal ball, but I'm just looking at the part of, there's a lot of use out there of oil and, and, and uh, propane. And if there's an opportunity to make that more efficient, that's where I'm coming from for at this point in point in time. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, seeing no further questions or comments, I will call the question. Uh, the motion moved by Mayor McQueen, seconded by Councillor Allen, was that whereas natural gas expansion has been a discussion in Grey Highlands over the years, and whereas most recently a business owner met with the CAO, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and local MPP Bill Walker about the possibility and process of expanding natural gas service throughout Grey Highlands. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Municipality of Grey Highlands establish a natural gas expansion task force of three councillors to further investigate the possibility of natural gas expansion and that staff be directed to bring forward a terms of reference for this task force to a future council meeting for approval. Uh, a, re a recorded vote was requested by Councillor Valiquet. Um, Clerk Martel, if you would do the honors. Uh, thank you. Your position on this, Councillor Valiquet. Sorry, I lost my unmute button. Uh, opposed. Councillor Allen. In favor. Councillor Allwood. In favor. Councillor Little. Opposed. Mayor McQueen. Councillor Nielsen. Opposed. Sorry, if I if I could um, have the mayor repeat his vote. His mic was not on, so I worry. Sorry, that. he was in favor. Thank you. And uh, Deputy Mayor Desai. In favor. By a vote of four to three, that motion has been carried. Thank you. Item 10.5 is a Point of order, Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion to move past five o'clock. Okay, moved by Councillor Nielsen, seconded by Mayor McQueen. <laughs> uh, since he does, he hardly gets to second this one, so we're, we're gonna pick on him. Uh, any discussion on the motion to move past five? And seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nielsen. Item 10.5 is the notice of motion from Mayor McQueen regarding the Ram Rodeo fundraiser. Uh, notice was provided in time with the current agenda. Uh, Mayor McQueen, I will assume you will move this motion. Yes, I do. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Do I have a seconder for the motion? 
Councillor Allwood. Uh, Mayor McQueen, you have the floor, sir. Sorry, Madam Clerk, I, I should have had my mic on when I spawned it there. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, and, and I apologize to Council for adding four notice of motions on today, but I, I thought the timing was sort of something that needed to be brought forward as, as of today. So, Ram Rodeo Fundraiser. So this sort of all came out of an opportunity, well, no, an opportunity, a discussion I had with our economic development officer and others in the community. And, um, you know, I look at all the fairs that have been canceled throughout our municipality and, and the, all our events are, and I will say it's nice to see the Kite Festival moving forward. And, and that is sort of a glimmer of hope. So anyway, long story short, I, I was, um, got in touch with um, Ross Miller, who is the, um, the, uh, I guess the operator of the Ram Rodeo, which is a rodeo um, that circulates throughout Ontario that hasn't uh, actually hasn't been active until last weekend. So with the COVID, uh, was very much affected by COVID and, and certainly was basically shelled until again, the first rodeo was last weekend in, in um, Orangeville, which I understand was quite a successful uh, rodeo. And just as a side, I, I realized that hosting had a rodeo last week as well, which I was surprised, but I guess it must be something about a rodeo. So the idea then came forward in a sense and, and you know, talked to him. I talked to members of the Kinsman. I talked to the foundation about the idea. I, talk, I mentioned it to the deputy mayor one day. I mentioned it to, I think, another counselor and just started talking about it and thought, hmm, is this something that is a possibility that could we have this as an event that sort of, hey, we're coming back, we're coming out of COVID. Is this an opportunity to have an event, an outdoor event that uh, give people an opportunity to go and do something, see people, have fun, bring the family. And then I sort of thought about it more and talked about it more and thought, well, is there, is there a way, you know, we looked at, um, uh, funding wise uh, with regards to um, capstone funding. Well, that was already used up this year. Other funding, you know, um, talk to our economic development officer, Harris, is there any funds that are in our budget? Well, this is topped out. That's topped out, you know? So anyway, so then I reached out to Ross Miller again and we had a site visit last Wednesday. I invited uh, Don McNulty from the egg society who, um, uh, so, I was thinking about Feversham because Feversham does has, has does have a very active fair, and they do have an area where they have a horse pinning area as well. So he came out, looked at the site, said, "Yeah, I think maybe we could make this work." Had a meeting last night with. Um, I, I was obviously the notice of motion was brought forward last last week. Had a meeting last night with the uh, Feversham Ag Society. Uh, got their blessing. They had, a, they had a few questions, concerns that uh, need to be followed up with the organizer, but uh, certainly uh, through a motion, they have um, supported the, because I think it was very important that we're using the um, agricultural uh, site where they use their fair every year. I know it's municipal property, but it's always nice to get that blessing and looking for a few volunteers. Certainly speaking with uh, uh, one of the kinsmen with their idea of, of searching out some volunteers there. And they felt that there could be maybe some there as well as the foundation. I had a great conversation with Darlene Lambrin, Lambrini, Lambrini, I think it is, uh, about the idea. thought it was a great idea. Um, so, so as you see on the notice of motion, my, my idea was, is could we have an event that would be outdoor, family oriented, uh, open to everyone, but also have an opportunity to raise funds for the hospital. I was looking at a win-win. So anyway, it sort of came forward. And, and so working with uh, uh, Michelle and, and uh, with great assistance from her and, and the CAO and working through our clerk, we were able to put the notice of motion here. And certainly, um, I will say one thing with the Ram Rodeo, it's sort of like bringing the circus to town. It's they sort of, for a price, they'll just bring it all. And, and basically all we need as far as volunteers with the exception of maybe a bit with the grounds is basically have somebody do the parking and somebody to click the tech to the receipts. They do all the promotion. They, they do online sales. Um, they look after all that part. They promote it um, certainly through, they create up a website. Uh, they do a lot of different things. Now, 
saying that, um, certainly in Ontario, the Ram Rodeo is sort of a, cir they circulate throughout communities. And I guess there's a competition at the end of, end of the season. They have a grand competition of all those. And I think uh, he indica indicated to me, there's over 200 competitors and uh, uh, bull riding, bulk, uh, bronco riding, um, um, pull bending i don't know all the terms of uh, <laughs> around rodeos in that sense but there's it's it's well entertaining and the idea would be is they would have two shows one on the saturday one on the sunday and they would take up maybe a 45 minute break and the idea of the plan here would also be an opportunity to have vendors there food vendors um, and we have a, a, a sponsorship package that would offer space for that so then you'd have the show you have a break and then you finish the show and you have an opportunity for families to say hi to everyone or say hello hey i haven't seen you for a while all that kind of stuff i'm maybe going on a little bit <laughs> but the idea is it's a it's a very um sort of the idea would be as a family oriented event that sort of kicks off coming out of covid and just that you know and to add to that an opportunity for a fundraiser so as you see in the report there is uh, there are there is some seed money that uh, can come from the economic and community development budget that could be used to uh, help offset some of the cost. I have my uh, work cut out for me to raise 21,000 or so dollars. Uh, roughly the, the cost is sort of been, it's around 30, 30 to $32,000 to bring that rodeo to, to uh, Great Highlands. So my, I have started to have those conversations. I reached out to uh, Bruce Power. I reached out to Ice River Springs. I've reached out just in the way up here. I'm reached out to Mike Croft. Uh, slash con I reached I'm going to reach out to a few of the aggregate operators there is already um, a draft um, a sponsorship package that can be sent out to to get that sponsorship and it starts with uh, the main sponsor of five thousand dollars um, 2500 750 and then 200 and from that it, it lists all the parts of of you get in the in the ring itself or the uh, I'm trying to think of the lingo rodeo um, the arena, I'm thinking it's the arena or wherever they compete. There is uh, banners with all the sponsors put up and then they get so many tickets uh, depending on the sponsorship as well. And if you're a vendor, you also get free admission as well for the weekend. And I think our vendor price, I think we set it at $200 for the weekend. And it's very important. And as you know, you have fairs and, and a number of things like that. You wanna invite your local food vendors because uh, they haven't been doing anything for 16, 18 months as well. So it's a great opportunity to support local. And it's just one of those ideas that uh, certainly we're looking for volunteers uh, to a certain degree, but it's it's one of those things. And, and also, as we had earlier on this year, we had um, um, a request come to us from uh, Harvey Fraser and, and uh, Dave Fawcett with regards to the thanking us for our donation for the hospital, but they are looking for more money for raising for that foundation to, to continue on that um, uh, I think five or six million dollars that they still need to raise. So the idea of this is, is this would be a, a, a municipal of Grey Highlands, uh, if, you know, for what funds would be raised would be um, go toward that, that ask. So it still becomes Grey Highlands. But the thing is, it's, it's, it's a win-win. So my, my thoughts were is an opportunity to just wrap up is an opportunity to have an event, to have fun, an opportunity for sponsorship to to provide sponsorship and be recognized through uh, uh, um, um, there's a, a what do you call it a menu not a menu a program a program that's in there and all the sponsorship that goes along there so they can donate 100 percent of that donation but 100 percent my idea my plan is is 100 percent of the gate receipts goes toward the hospital foundation so that's the plan thank you <laughs> thank you uh any further questions or comments Right. Seeing none, there is a motion moved by Mayor McQueen, seconded by Councillor Allwood. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry, Councillor Allen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I see it's it's got a September date. Are you is the mayor considering this year? I'm going to be on the phone tomorrow. <laughs> okay, that's pretty short notice to get all that in line and get the public aware and. Um, people to attend. I know people aren't doing a lot of things right now, but still is pretty short notice. Um, I, I guess one of my concerns is the, the outdoor events um, depend on heavily on the weather cooperating. 
and uh, late September, it, um, being the grounds chair for a split rail festival for 20 years, and you can have beautiful sunshine or you can actually have snow. So, uh, and, and quite often rain. So, and that definitely affects the um, attendance to an outdoor event. Um, I guess a question is what kind of um, income is the mayor thinking that this will generate? Um, I'm looking at the, the cost, uh, 10,000 and something um, of, of municipal money. Um, so yes, what can I ask that question before I comment further? Hi, uh, Mayor McQueen. So the two two days, and, and, and maybe at a certain time, I may ask uh, Director Harris to uh, maybe add a few details. But the venue, and, and this this is something I need to add. The, is um, I asked a question to the organizer. I'll get back to that just briefly. I asked a, the question to the organizer about COVID and the. Um, uh, how many can you have there? And, and basically from the province, it's been uh, said that 75% of your 75% um, uh, of your allocation of people or space, you, you can't have any more. And that's what Orangeville did. They, they, whatever the numbers they could hold, they could go at the 75. And we do need the blessing of Grey Bruce Health Unit. And that's that's been submitted to get that blessing. Uh, so I think it's looked upon, um, I may uh, go to the director, but I think it was 1,500 is the per day is the space. Because the, the, I'm going to hit that thing. The, the, the um, organizer provides a lot of the uh, um, bleachers. And there's there that numbers is all calculated in, into that, and there's also some bleachers there from the Feversham Ag Society. So of that calculation of eleven, say eleven hundred people, the tickets are twenty five dollars per adult. Uh, I think it's fifteen dollars per youth, and with the accompaniment company of uh, adult um, five and under are are free, which we wouldn't want to charge for five and under anyway. But um, so the idea, do your question. I think it would be great if I could if we could raise at least twenty five thousand uh, dollars. Further comments or questions, Councillor Allen? Thank you. So my I, I think my big concern is the short notice and depending on the weather cooperating. I I fully support this another year, but um, that, that's three weeks away three weeks in a bit. Uh, that's, uh, I know the mayor can get things done when he puts his mind to it, but um, that's, that's awfully short notice. Thank you. Mayor McQueen, your I can speak to that and, and certainly that conversation and uh, the Ram Rodeo and maybe um, um, Ms. Harrison could speak to that. They already, it's already set to go. The, the, the campaign and it's already on the they they're, they're going into like late october with these rodeos so there's like um they just added another one and just happened to be this space so i asked a question about weather and they they go rain and shine uh unless it's lightning out they stop for lightning but other than that it's it's rain and shine and i, and I know that could have a little bit of a damper on the public but just as an example of this past weekend of the orangeville rodeo um the advanced sales were just off the record they were just it was unbelievable they sold out on the saturday and i'm not sure on the sunday and it, their numbers were a lot higher and i don't know what kind of money they were raising but it just it just seems to be people are just want to go to something there just hasn't been anything and that's that's sort of the cap that's why it's sort of the, op, the idea here is there's just nothing to go to and people are the, the just as an example, the, the Agricultural Society in Feversham looked at the tractor pole. They declined on it. It's gone to um, Dundalk on the 10th and 11th, I think, they're having that tractor pole. And I spoke to one of the organizers was asking me about a farm safety booth. And they said last week they had 17,000 views on the tractor pole on their website. I said, you're going to get people from Texas and Georgia coming to this. And he just said, it's just, it's just, it's just so much interest on just because there hasn't been anything. And, and that's sort of the thing is, is part of the seed money here as well is 
to sort of have that event to just to kick off something. And, and so I know it's, it's a, it's a tall task and, and yes, Councillor Allen, I have a tall task in raising a lot of money, but there's a lot of businesses out there that uh, I'm going to seek and I'm going to search out and with the package and um, the one thing with the Orangeville rodeo, they were overwhelmed by sponsorship. They just couldn't believe it. How much, how many people wanted to be part of this. And uh, you know what? I, you have to go on it. So I, <laughs> I will jump in there. We have been going on on this item for a half hour at least. Um, so unless there's any further new comments or questions, sorry. Thank you. Director Harris has her hand raised, but you can't see. Okay. Uh, Director Harris, please make it quick. Thank you very much. I will. Um, I just wanted to let um, Council know as well is that the Ram Rodeo has a promotion alarm and they have a huge following of rodeo enthusiasts from across the province. This is considered a tourism event and their traditional sales cycle for tickets is three weeks. So um, they are optimistic that, that three weeks is not out of the realm at all. It certainly will be for our local audiences um, and for the mayor who has to go out and solicit all these sponsorships. He tells me he has his cowboy hat and boots ready to do that. Um, so I think that's real. The pre pressure will be, I think the tickets, we've got all the social media and the promotional posters, et cetera, are ready to go. Uh, Sergio Gavin, I see you have, I've been told you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just reviewing the notice of motion and um, I've got some questions um, surrounding clarity. Uh, the $10,250 from the economic and community development budget, um, I think we need to emphasize that that would be part of the contribution to the hospital. And also that uh, all proceeds, I think it should say that all net proceeds uh, from the event used to support the commitment also. Um, I think we need to be very clear as to what um, money would go to the hospital. Obviously the uh, mayor and, hi and his ability to obtain sponsorship, those monies would be used to set up the event and would not be used as a contribution to the hospital. So I just think it just needs a little tweaking just to have a little bit more clarity. Thank you. I'm okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, CEO Gavin. Uh, Mayor McQueen is okay with it. Councillor Allwood as the seconder. Councillor Allen, I do see you. I will be with you in a moment. Councillor Allwood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm fine with the uh, changes that the CAO has proposed. Okay, thank you. Councillor Allen. Thank you. I'll make this quick. So the comment by the CAO, um, are, are you saying that the 10,000 and change used as seed money will come from the contribution to the hospital? So if, and I, I hope it doesn't happen, but if for some reason it didn't raise as much money as we thought, it wouldn't be costing the taxpayers money, it would be costing the, the um, foundation some money. Is that correct? Uh, CEO Gavin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, yes, that's exactly what I'm stressing, that we need to make sure that we emphasize that any money that is provided would be a contribution. I have full faith in Mayor McQueen's ability to fundraise, so I'm sure he'll fundraise more than the 30 or $32,000. Uh, and then hopefully we won't have to use the 10,250, but I just think we have to be clear um, that if we do utilize those funds that they would come out of the contribution um, to the hospital. Thank you, CEO Gavin. And, and, last, and last question, the Kite Festival, it's the weekend prior, correct? Correct. Okay. Two weeks ahead. It's September 19th. Or 19th, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any further questions or comments? Seeing none, a motion was moved by Mayor McQueen, seconded by Councillor Allwood. 
whereas the res residents of the municipality of Grey Highlands have not been able to host in-person gatherings for over 18 months since the onset of COVID-19, and whereas the municipality of Grey Highlands has a commitment to support the new Markdale Hospital in the amount of 1,200,000, now therefore be it resolved that the Council of Grey of Grey Highlands does hereby direct staff to proceed with scheduling and hosting a Ram Rodeo event at the Osprey Community Center on the weekend of September 25th and 26th as a fundraiser to support the municipality's commitment to the new Markdale Hospital fundraising. And that this event will be supported by volunteers from the community, including the Feversham Agricultural Society and the Feversham Kinsmen, and that $10,250 from the municipality's economic and community development budget be used to support the cost of event hosting and that the remaining 21,750 rodeo hosting cost be generated through sponsorship sales undertaken by the mayor on behalf of the municipality and that all proceeds for all net proceeds from the event used to support the municipality's commitment to the to the new Marktel hospital those in favor of the motion any opposed? That is carried unanimously. I'll make you proud, Councillor Allen. <laughs> All right. I'll take back the chair then. So uh, moving on then to uh, county report. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yes, right. I always forget that because we get caught up in ones we have. Are there any notice of motions that wish to be brought forward at this time? Councilor Balaket. Thank you, Mayor and Chair. Yes, I wanted to bring forward the uh, notice of motion uh, that is associated with the delegation that we uh, received today from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance um, that was mistakenly left off of the um, agenda, and I was hoping that um, we would be able to address it here today. I am trying. It has been emailed to everyone, but I will just copy and paste it into the chat. No, I won't. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mayor McQueen. Uh, so this was my error. Um, Councillor Valak had actually sent this notice of motion to me back in July after the last council meeting for inclusion on this agenda, and I missed adding it to this agenda. So it it does meet the notice timelines. However, in order for it to be um, uh, considered today by this council, there would need to be a recommendation from council to allow the greenhouse gas pollution motion to be voted on at the current meeting. Is that adequate, Councillor Bellicat? Uh, yes. So I guess I'll put forward that motion to um, for next meeting. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna move it right now. Oh, okay. You, you want it for so that has to get two thirds majority, right? Correct. That's what I just yeah. said. You have to oh. put forward the motion to discuss it today. Are you prepared to do that today, or do you wish to leave it to the next meeting? No, I'm prepared to do it today. Okay, so it needs two thirds, two thirds majority. Councillor Little, do you have a question of clarity? Yeah, or do you wish to say? Yes, I'm wondering if if this is time sensitive or it could wait till next meeting. Um, it would be, I think, um, beneficial to to um, see the petition that was referred to, and um, I think there might be more. I think it would just be. Um, Better for council to have the opportunity to to see it, unless it's unless it is time sensitive. Just a suggestion, Councilor Bellicat. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I believe there's some time sensitivity associated with it, but I I, I don't. I think it, they're in the process of um, just going to municipality municipality. Um, so I, I think that this this could be uh, reevaluated, um, uh, or sorry, deferred until uh, until next next meeting. I guess I'm sort of hesitating and and, and um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, res I'll respect that Councillor Little would mo like more time with this. It wasn't on, on the agenda and uh, there is certainly much more information out there on um, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, um, in particular around the costs and associated with different sources of uh, energy that per perhaps should be checked out. Okay, so just for clarity, you're making the notice of motion for the next meeting then, is that correct? Okay, so for clarity on that part. Are there any other notice of motions? Councillor Allwood, do you have a notice of motion or do you have com a comment here? I just wanted to comment on this uh, notice of motion. Uh, I like the fact that we've uh, deferred it. There was a, uh, for those that attended AMO, the Ontario Energy's Future Transformation, Innovation and Emerging Trends in the Energy Sector. So there was an interesting discussion that sort of... Um, so, so I want to limit discussion because generally, if it's a notice of motion coming forward, then that comes for the discussion. Yeah. Hopefully, the hopefully that, that, that information is still available online. You can look at that session. and There was a, a lots of discussion yeah. on this subject. So it, uh, if you're doing some research, please yeah. avail yourself of the opportunity to look at it. Thank you. Yeah, it's up for 30 days from... I think it's probably another week or so, and I have gone back. So yeah, if you have an opportunity, if you were at that, for sure. Councillor Little, I do, go ahead. Thank you. Um, more a question of process, but um, I wondered if, if it was appropriate right now to bring forward a notice of motion related to the delegation on the Lake Eugenia water quality. And um, um, if so, then Excellent. I would. Okay. Yeah. Bring that Is notice. That is that appropriate? Yep. Can, yep. Um, I mean, it's it, you'd have to have it crafted before next meeting, or no, um, the Wednesday by noon of the Monday. Monday, <laughs> more yeah. preferably. Okay. Yeah. No, Monday. I can do that. Okay. 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 Uh, my other my other question is. Oh um, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just getting a side conversation. Sorry, Councillor Little, go ahead. I apologize. Um, I had a bit of a brain cramp during item 7.2, which was the Burnside Park cat. Um, I did want to, if I can bring forward a direct motion, which would have been an amendment to the motion to support that initiative, which was, um, am I allowed to do that? Bring forward a direct motion to address something that I forgot to bring up earlier. Uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you. So you would present a notice of motion and then you would request council to waive the procedure bylaw to have it discussed today, which would require two thirds. So it's a different notice of motion. It's a direct motion. You want to speak to something that we've already talked about, right? So you want to. Um, yes, I want to add something that I forgot to mention um, when we were discussing item 7.2, which was the Burnside Parkette. So you wish to bring, is it just for information or is it actually a, a direction that you wish to provide that no, you wish to it's see? Direct, it's direction. Okay, procedurally. Uh, thank you. So procedurally it's, and I'm going to confuse everybody, but it technically is a motion to reconsider a motion that was passed at the current meeting. So it's not necessarily a notice of motion. So it's a motion to, you just move a motion to reconsider the motion passed uh, 2021-589 at the current meeting. So the two ways that a notice uh, that a motion to reconsider can occur is if it was from a previous meeting, it has to happen by notice of motion. But if it's still at the current meeting, you can just move a motion to reconsider. And if it passes, then that motion comes back on the table again. So if you're to do it now, you have to have two thirds majority to reconsider it right now. Do you understand, Councillor Little? I, I do. I'm just looking up that um, motion. <sighs> So the resolution that passed there was that the council received the report, the council approved allocating 30,000 from the Markdale Hydro Reserve to support the rehabilitation, and that council approved the municipality entering into a funding agreement with FedDev Ontario for approved funding from the Canada Community Revitalization Fund in the amount of 121,400. Mm. And just, just for your thinking, to reconsider it takes two thirds, right? Yeah. 
Now, are you able to give the indication of what that reconsideration is before you say you want a motion to reconsider? Is that part of the procedure? So if Council Little wants us to reconsider, it, can, can that reason be also mentioned before in that whole reason of wanting it to be reconsidered? Like, so I want to reconsider because of X, Y, Z, or, or does it only say, I wanted to reconsider this, we take the vote, and then she explains what the points are. Uh, for clarity, Your Worship. So you're not allowed to debate a motion to reconsider. However, the person who moves the motion may make a brief and concise statement indicating the reasons for such uh, reconsideration proposal. There you go. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Do you want me to go ahead, Mr. Mayor? If you wish. Yes. Um, so I would like um, to um, reconsider the motion um, in item 7.2, the purpose being that I was um, wanting to include in that motion that staff investigate the feasibility of public washrooms at the Burnside Parkette. Okay, do I have a seconder? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Alwyn. Okay, so that puts the motion for reconsideration and the reason short part as to include public washrooms. And um, there is no debate, as I understand, and it takes two thirds majority to bring this motion back for a reconsideration. Okay, does everybody understand? So I'm gonna call the, so we have that. Um, so just for the public, it's a motion to reconsider item 7.2 uh, to include the idea of including public washrooms. And that was second by Councillor Alwitt, thereabouts, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna call the vote. Those wish to uh, call the vote to reconsider. All in favor? Opposed? That motion's carried. Okay, so coming back to this. Uh, so now procedurally, uh, it's back on. And so do you wish to move a motion, Councillor Little? I would move the same motion um, that's in the agenda and that we previously passed and include the clause that staff investigate the feasibility of public washrooms at the Burnside Parkette. Okay, sorry, Madam Clerk. Um, just for clarity, so the main motion as moved and seconded is now back in front of council as it is. So um, Councillor Little would then be moving an amendment to that main motion to include that separate clause. Oh, not a new motion. Okay, so. So, so clarity, Mr. Mayor, would I just move the amendment? So who owns the original motion? The original motion is still owned by the mover and seconder that moved it originally. Okay. Okay, I gotta go back and that was Councillor Little and Councillor Bell. Right, so the original mover and seconder was Little and Bellaquette. So Councillor Little, you're moving an amendment to the original motion. And your right. amendment is? That staff uh, be directed to investigate the feasibility of um, public washrooms at the Burnside Parkette. Do I have a seconder for that amendment? Deputy Mayor. Okay, so do you wish to speak to that amendment? Um, I did um, have a discussion with um, Director Harris about this. Um, there, are, there are issues with having public washrooms, um, but I think uh, on the positive side of things, for people who are traveling, um, and there are a lot of people traveling through Markdale, the availability of public washrooms is, is um, pretty slight. And I think particularly people, um, well, anyone, but people with families traveling through, if there were um, um, awareness, I guess, that there were public washrooms in downtown Markdale, I think it would attract more people to, to stopping in downtown Markdale. Um, the drawbacks uh, that Councillor, or sorry, Director Harris mentioned to me were just the um, um, threat of vandalism, I guess, and the um, um, that there would be maintenance um, responsibilities. I would note that there are um, different organizations in the municipality, the Horticultural Society, 
uh, the Rotary Club and uh, the chamber were involved in the discussion of the parquet, that there would be um, some community possibility for community in involvement in doing this. So my, my amendment is simply to look at the feasibility of public washrooms, um, weighing the pros and cons, and um, you know, bringing that back to council um, to see if this was something that uh, council wanted. I'm done speaking, I don't know who's. <laughs> I don't know what's going on right now. We can't hear anybody. Can those on Zoom hear me? I think the Zoom, uh... I can hear you, Paul. Uh, we can't hear. Can't hear today. council chambers. Yeah, I think that's the issue. Says the battery is dead. So for members of the public, whoever may be able to hear us, they may not, but the battery is dead on our uh, mic transmitter. So it is just being changed at the present time. Should we take a break, girl? Can you hear me now? Are we back? Okay, so for members of the public who may have um, not been able to hear us, um, the battery was dead in our mic transmitter for council chambers, so it just had to be changed. Slight technical difficulty, but we got it fixed. We got the experts here and we're back online with an extra battery, always carry one spare. So Council Little, um, I, uh, we heard what you had to say and now um, the Deputy Mayor, who was a seconder, doesn't have anything to add. So now I'm going to Councillor Nielsen for comments. Just a question through you, Mr. Mayor, to staff. Um, my understanding is that every summer we have a porta potty facility in or around the Burnside Parkette. Just wanted to get clarity on that. Councillor Harris, or Director Harris, sorry. Thank you through Chair McQueen to Council. Yes, we do have porta potties in there every summer for the last few summers. Okay, and Madam CEO, do you have a comment? I see your hands up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd just like clarification. Is this um, an item to bring back in the 2022 budget? I do know that the, sorry, I had traffic. Um, I do know that the grant application has gone in. It was very specific. We can't add it to the um, grant application at this point. Um, and are we talking about a permanent structure? So I just want some clarification. Thank you. I think I'm going to go back to Council Little, and then I'm going to go back to Council Nielsen because I think it said about the feasibility. But Council Little, can you address those points that have been raised? Um, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I guess it would be a, a budget item and um, and, a, and a permanent um, structure. Okay. Council Nielsen, did you have anything to, else to add? No. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it was in 2000, maybe it was a millennium. Oh, there's my phone. Um, millennium project that we put a they put a bathroom um, in Flesherton at the Memorial Park, and it was nothing but trouble, vandalism. I know Flesherton doesn't have town water, so there was issue with, um, with um, safety of water, but it was vandalized, and then it was fixed, and then it was vandalized, then it was fixed, and it just went on and on. They closed it, and they tore it down. Um, so I, as much as I have needed <laughs> public washrooms, especially during COVID when all the restaurants and the Tim Hortons and things were closed, um, I, I just, I think it would be a, a real burden on staff and um, would end up being vandalized. Thank you. 
Okay. Councillor Allwood. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just uh, to go back to my friend, Roger Brooks, uh, 20 ingredients of an outstanding destination in downtown. Public washrooms are number 10 on that list. And the number one reason passersby stop in a town is to use the restroom facilities. They should be in the heart of the spending districts. Once visitors get out of the car, you have a four times greater chance of them getting them to spend money. So it's there for information purposes. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Any further comments? Uh, again, this is just looking at the opportunity. It's not suggesting that it has to be right now, but it's looking at the feasibility of, of what the options are. So, Councillor Nielsen. Can I get clarity on how the motion will get worded because now council little is saying that'll be added to the budget question as it can't be added to the grant application so how would the motion be worded then as the amendment madam clerk um thank you um respectfully now that i have heard the resolution in relation to that it really didn't relate to the grant application which was the item that was on there so the reconsideration probably was not the best method and what should have happened was that a notice of motion should have been proceeded with however we've gone down this path so we're going to continue um, so the amendment is that the main motion be amended by adding the clause that staff be directed to investigate the feasibility of public washrooms at Burnside Park at so the main motion will still read what it read before. And then if this amendment passes, this amendment will be added to it and staff will just separate the clauses based on what the individual needs of that resolution are. So they will look at the um, grant application funding as those two clauses. And then they would look at this this separate amendment as, as even though it's kind of part of this, it's, it's they'll look at it separately and deal with it separately. There's my, <laughs> uh, just before I move on, Councillor Little, are you okay with that, uh, how that's uh, it's working itself through? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, thanks to Madam Clerk, and I apologize to my colleagues on Council for uh, the confusion. Well, it's an education part too, so we learn as we go along, and it's we're all having fun, so that's good. Councillor Allen. Thank you. I, I'm I'm curious to ask Councillor Little how this differs from the request for a floating dock um, that it's a individual council members uh, request and shouldn't be added to the budget and it, it seems like this is exactly exactly the same thing. Thank you. Okay. I, 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 I'm going to stop things right there. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, obviously, um, I, I think probably in fairness to Councillor Little, she probably thought it could be added to the grant, but that got clarity that it, it wasn't part of the grant. So, yes, I think uh, I think notice of motions has been discussed today is that's the avenue for bringing stuff forward. And, and we'll leave that one alone for now. Councillor Little. I just would like to say, Your Worship, that um, we have been talking about Markdale downtown revitalization, and this directly relates to that project. So um, I don't see it as being um, something outside of our priorities, but I do take your point, uh, Councillor Allen, and um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, do better next time. <laughs> okay. Is there any new, any new discussion on this uh, amendment to the main motion? Okay, seeing there's no uh, new, new items, uh, all in favor of this am amendment. amendment, yes. Opposed? That's carried. I'm not sure what Councillor Allen, you weren't froze there, but I guess that was in the negative. So that was carried. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, main motion is amended. And originally that was moved by Councillor Little and Councillor Valiquette. Uh, any further discussion on that main motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right. Are there any other notice of motions? I want to miss that part. All right, moving on. County highlights. Uh, Deputy Mayor, do you have anything? I was just going to pull up the last, uh, I guess it was August 9th? No, August 12th, or I can't remember what the date was. 
we had a committee in the hall, but the, I don't know if we need to talk about that anymore. So, um, and if not, I don't, nothing comes to off the top of my head. No, nothing off the top of my head. Um, I will say that as most of you know, that I, um, I voted against the expansion of Grey Gables. Uh, my reasons for that were, uh, first of all, the cost. Um, obviously, the second reason was also with regards to the, um, the staffing. We're, we're chronically understaffed at the 66 beds that we have right now. Um, so to, to be able to maintain the levels of service expected from a not-for-profit uh, home when we have 128 beds and not a significant increase in, in staffing um, is irresponsible. Uh, in my mind, anyways, in my opinion, um, that's why I voted to pause it. Um, it's not it's not a cancellation of the expansion. It's simply a pause, and the the beds aren't being lost. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. Um, a lot more has been made of it on social media, and um, I can understand um, people's disappointment, but. Um, I cannot in good conscience uh, make, make a decision that leads to a drop in the level of care or leads to a uh, risk for the residents that would be added to that facility, um, which is why I made I, just, I voted the way I did. And um, I, I don't think I have anything further to say about that. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just going through the, quickly going through the agenda. Um, I don't see the... the, the, the. There was some budget assumptions and timetables. Uh, I guess everybody has the opportunity to, to look at. Oh, the one thing it, it is of note is the Feversham Sand Dome. And I do have uh, a notice of motion coming to the next county council meeting. And those that uh, are maybe somewhat aware, there's a, a, a large tear now in the dome. And, and they're sort of suggesting that that uh, they sort of brought a letter forward at the last county council meeting, a report saying that. Uh, they gave us notice in 2018, but the the uh, report, the agreement says that the county must officially give us three years notice of the termination of the agreement of the uh, Feversham Sand Dome. Um, saying that, um, so they're the responsibility of the repairs and then we get billed 45% of the 55% that they look after. So. Uh, part of the part of the debate that's been going on over the years is us buying that, but buying it for a very, 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 very small money. But there's also been the talk about um, the deficiency of ambulance service in the Feversham area. So my notice of motion that's coming forward uh, next county council is to come back with a report to address the um, uh, shortfall of service in the Feversham area from the EMS from the county's uh, EMS services. And it's always been thought if there was an additional bay added that those lands where the sand dome was uh, is located that could be that future location. So, um, so I'm pushing for that uh, report. And they, you know, through um, through the uh, EMS report, they've indicated that there is a deficiency in the sense of service compared to the rest of the county in that area, just because of the location of EMS uh, depots. So, anyway, that's uh, something that I'm bringing forward at the next uh, next meeting on that. And uh, there's a few subdivision reports. Other than that, it was, uh, uh, you know, it's there for if anybody ever, anybody who is on our council wishes to have questions answered on reports there. We are, myself and the deputy mayor are certainly here for it during this portion of our agenda to answer those questions. If you do see one that you wish to bring up. Is there any questions from council? Can I have a motion to receive the verbal report? Councilor Nielsen, deputy mayor. Any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Uh, Councilor Pliviches, is there anything that's uh, we're stuck? Yep, Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I don't know how many people watched it last night, but Team Canada beat out uh, Team USA in Women's Hockey uh, World Championships to win gold. Uh, I think it was an overtime goal. Um, and it's the first time I believe we won gold since 2012, I want to say. Uh, so congratulations to Team Canada. And uh, what about the Team Canada girl, women's at the Olympics? We haven't met since the Olympics, have we? No, no, right. So there was soccer, uh, which I listened to uh, the commentary on radio. And uh, so women's, uh, the team, women's 
national team, the Canadian women's national team won gold at the uh, Olympics for soccer as well. Uh, in addition to, I, I believe it was the uh, four by 100 meter relay team, uh, women's relay team for swimming, uh, uh, both of which really exciting events. And I definitely didn't get as much of the Olympics as I would have wanted to. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it's definitely been exciting times for women's sports in Canada. Thank you. Other comments, privileges from council wish to speak? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it was maybe in the 2020 budget, we um, approved hiring um, people to look after, one for Flesher and one for Markdale to look after um, keeping weeds down and things like that. For the first year, I didn't see anything happening. This year, there's been a tremendous improvement. Um, now obviously, I'm speaking on, on Flesherton because I drive through it four or five or six times a day. Uh, a few weeks ago, Colin was out weed whacking the sidewalks <laughs> um, of weeds and um, did the downtown core. And uh, it looks wonderful. Uh, he was back, I think, a week or so later doing either more um, different areas or just keeping the weeds that were coming up again down. I stopped and talked to him, told him he was doing a great job and how good it looked. And also I'd like to comment on the watering of the flowers. Um, the flowers in Flesherton, again, I'm only speaking of Flesherton, um, did a good job. They look great, um, well-maintained. So it, um, it's nice to see um, some of the extras that we included in, in the budget going to, to do good things. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for those great comments, uh, Councillor Allen, and uh, seeing the, the real results of things happening in a positive way. That's fantastic. Any further comments? I do want to say uh, briefly that, uh, I always say that briefly, I guess, but I, it will be brief. <laughs> um, that uh, as we know, we purchased this year in the roads department, the um, uh, skid steer, um, uh, what do you call it? Compactor, not uh, shredder, ditch shredder, whatever. And so they were over uh, closer to my neck of the woods uh, this last few weeks and uh, Austria bluffs and, and cleaning up. And uh, I thought, wow, that's gonna be the real test. And you know something, it's uh, only I have one comment, other comments saying that's positive, they can see better. And I took a drive last night and I know with all the, um, with all the uh, moisture we've had this year, it's all greening up and it just looks where they've done it. It looks amazing. So I, I want to put that shout out that uh, thanks to the road crew for, I know they've uh, taken some criticism over the years, but that's certainly that piece of equipment is certainly complemented what they're doing this year. And it's, a, it's, it's just interesting to see it now that the uh, moisture, it's all greening up and it just looks like a manicured, um, shoulder on the side of the road, which gives them the opportunity to put snow and also keep the roads dry. So a shout out to the roads department on that one. So seeing there's no other comments, questions and council privileges, I do have one other thing. Um, I think it's worthy to the announcement that our Madam Clerk is celebrating her 20th anniversary today. I'll put a round of applause for that one. Eh? For clarity, it's my 20th wedding anniversary, not my 20th anniversary with the municipality. <laughs> 20th wedding anniversary. Apologize. I got caught up in the motion. So, yes. Everybody knew what I was talking about. 20 years married. So, that's amazing. So, there you go. Uh, we're going to go into closed session, but uh, I think we probably need a little break. I might need a sandwich. What's your wish? Does that work for everybody? 10 minute break? Okay, so do we need to go in camera first and take a break or we come back and then go in camera, Madam Clerk? So we move the motion, but the motion say that we move into closed session at 610. Okay, all right. So I need a motion then to, to move into in, in closed session with the items that are appointed here. Councilor Nielsen, Deputy Mayor, that the council's proceed into closed session at a time and that'll be 610 to discuss, sorry. Oh, sorry, Madam Clerk. Um, and that uh, Director Harris be in attendance as required. Okay, as okay, as Director Harris be in attendance as required. And see, in the two, three items that are listed on the agenda be included on those items. Uh, any other discussion to that in-camera session? 
All in favor? That's carried. So we'll we'll recess and we'll go in the camera at six ten. Thank you. That's on.
Yes, you get the mask off. All right, we uh, are now back in open session, and I need a motion to, that a closed uh, that a closed meeting was held, and only the closed session items were identified, were discussed in the closed session. That there's nothing to report. Uh, Deputy Mayor, Councilor Nielsen, all in favor of that? That's carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on. We have a list of upcoming meetings. Um, they're listed there. Our next council meeting is September 15th. Holy smoke, September. We're here for September today. Uh, we need one more motion with regards to the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? I'll look to the screen. Councillor Little, Councillor Allwood. Any discussion? All in favor? That is carried. Just as because it's. Uh, uh, um, Traditional, I need a motion to adjourn. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Nielsen. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. Thank you and good Thank night. You, Take care. Yeah, bye for now, everyone. <laughs>